In terms of chairperson's business members, I'd just like to inform you that Tom um, of the com uh, committee team is on paternity leave. His wife gave birth to a baby boy last Thursday um, named Jacob, so I think we will send our congratulations to him through the clerk. Um, members, the first meeting of the East West Council took place on March the 22nd and the committee did not receive prior notification of this and has not received any information on the meeting from the department. So. With your agreement, I'm going to write to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to ask to be informed of any future East-West Council meetings. Or, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So item three then, um, members, the draft minutes of the meeting um, held on the 20th of March 2024 are at pages 6 to 11 of the meeting pack. Um, are we content with the minutes? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I'll go ahead and sign them. Okay, so matters arising. So, um, members, at the last meeting, you'll recall that the Victims and Survivors Service stated that research papers would be forwarded to the committee and summaries of these reports are found in the pack under correspondence. Okay, so moving on to the substantive part of our meeting. So, members, um, we're going to move into our oral evidence session and I would bring your attention to page 42 of the clerk's brief. And I'm going to welcome to the meeting Fiona Ryan, Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse, and Denise Morgan, Head of Policy Research and Development. So I would invite you to brief the committee. Thank you. Thank you so much, and good afternoon to the committee. Um, I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to appear before you today. Um, before I start discussing the work of my office, because I promised to give you an oversight of the office, I want to offer my profound thanks to the victims and survivors of historical institutional child abuse whom I've had the privilege of meeting and listening to over the past three and a half years. Um, I also want to thank the victim and survivor groups for the work they do day in and day out supporting victims and survivors. I think we need to acknowledge that victims and survivors are the ones who live with the lifelong legacy of institutional childhood abuse and the abuse that they suffered as children in institutions and their interests must always be paramount and at the heart of everything that we do. So thank you. Um, since taking up office late in 2020, I've prioritised meeting and listening to victims and survivors. We've just marked our third full year in operation and in that relatively short time, almost 1,000 individuals have made contact with my office. It's not easy for victims and survivors to reach out and make that call and I want to acknowledge that. I know from the many survivors that I've met and listened to that acknowledging what has happened to them for themselves can be extremely difficult and it can take considerable time for survivors to consider applying for redress or seeking support and services or just reaching out to tell someone what happened to them. You know, one woman told us that she kept a, a leaflet that we had hidden behind her clock for, you know, a number of months and she would take it out and put it away and take it out and put it away until finally she said, I'm going to actually make the call. And another gentleman then told us, and he was shaking when he was speaking to us on the phone, that he had waited three months, and each day he said he was going to do it, and then couldn't. And then when he did, he was like, this was the day he was going to make the call. And um, we're obviously incredibly grateful, and we know how privileged we are that victims and survivors choose us to engage with. So while we have been able to support these victims and survivors of historic institutional childhood abuse, I would also like to let the committee know about another group of survivors that we've been contacted by. Um, because I think it's really important for you as a committee to be aware of these people as well. During the household leaflet drop which happened last year, my office received over 250 calls um, over a period of three weeks. While two out of three of the callers were um, victims of historical and institutional childhood abuse and were within the remit of my office, one in three were not. One in three were victims and survivors of other forms of child abuse. And I think that's really important that we acknowledge the courage that it took for them to reach out. And I just thought it was important to bring it to this committee's attention today. Um, I will speak about this later as well um, in relation to the lack of data that we have in general on victims and survivors. Separately, I remain acutely aware that victims and survivors who left Northern Ireland um, the abuse that they experienced being a key factor. I mean, I've travelled to Britain, I've met victims and survivors, and they've told me, you know, about their lives, about their experiences, and why they left where they were from. 
and that they are at increased risk of not knowing about their entitlements here in Northern Ireland. I suppose it's not to say that there are not victims of historical institutional child abuse in Northern Ireland who are not aware of their entitlements. We know there are still survivors here who aren't. And unfortunately, I cannot provide an insight into the extent of that because I don't have data. And I think that's one of the issues that I would like to bring to the attention of this committee, and I've said it to you in the opportunities that I've had to engage with you individually. Um, we are concerned about the dearth of data and research in this area. Um, we think that it will have a negative impact on planning and resourcing. Um, my office has supported the awareness initiatives which were run in Northern Ireland and which have been undertaken rather in the last year. But again, I am very, very concerned that victims and survivors outside of Northern Ireland are at risk of not knowing about their entitlements unless potentially they still have those ties with family and friends in Northern Ireland. But not every survivor has those ties. And in fact, part of the process of leaving where you're from because you experience trauma can often be cutting or reducing the ties. Um, that's why in the space of the last 12 months, I've undertaken um, two international awareness initiatives in addition to supporting the Executive Office Northern Ireland initiatives to promote the entitlements to victims and survivors in Britain, the Republic of Ireland, in Canada and Australia. Going forward, I feel there is a strong need for targeted promotion of um, services, supports, redress to victims and survivors both in Northern Ireland and outside Northern Ireland. While there's an element of time moving on because we're entering into the last year of redress, it is more than just redress. It's about being able to access services and supports that may be very much needed, particularly as people get older and they're living with their lifelong legacy of abuse. It may also be a way for Northern Ireland to say to those victims and survivors who have left, who fled, we have not forgotten you. I think that's important. Um, as in relation to redress, as we enter the final year of redress, my office continues to provide general information and advice to victims and survivors considering applying for redress. I know that the review of the redress process is yet to be published, and I've asked for a proposed timeline for its publication. In the meantime, I continue to engage with the victims and survivors about their needs in relation to redress and considering applying for redress, and um, also with the Historical Institution Abuse Redress Board and with the Victim and Survivor Service who are supporting survivors compile their statements of experience. We're also working with the TEO on progressing the recommendations of the review and with other relevant stakeholders. I spoke earlier about the absence of data, and this absence of data does make it harder to know how many people we need to reach in order to inform of their entitlements. Um, I think it was the Northern Ireland Auditor's Office who noted that in relation to historical institutional childhood abuse, that the data on the number of children who resided in residential homes over the period in question is not complete, and therefore we're unable to provide a reliable estimate of the numbers of eligible victims and survivors. This was in the context of redress. Last year we published a paper, <coughs> which some of you may have read, asking that consideration be given to a potential survey into prevalence in the population of historical, non-recent child abuse, and because the international comparators are mainly around child sexual abuse, that this could be considered for Northern Ireland. I asked consideration to be given to such a prevalence study in the hope that it might provide more insight into prevalence and experience of historical institutional abuse. And I think I've remarked to you the fact that one in three calls to my office during, a, in a, I suppose, in all, or sorry, Northern Ireland awareness initiative were from victims and survivors who were stating that they were abused in other contexts. Um, I suppose it would also underline the need for research in the area, which was a recommendation of the 2020 Gillen Review. In relation to memorial, um, and my intention is to speak to those issues that are of relevance to victims and survivors. Memorial is a deeply important issue for many victims and survivors. Um, to do memorial, to understand memorial, um, we must make adequate acknowledgement of what has occurred. It is a recommendation of the Historic Institution Abuse Inquiry. Um, following international research and consultation, I recommended to the Executive Office that it consider a memorial program. This program would encompass the inquiry recommendation of physical memorial, but in parallel could include additional types of memorial, such as education, heritage, arts, and social history. 
It could make memorials a process more widely available to victims and survivors of historical institutional childhood abuse and to wider society and potentially to future generations. I've also recommended that a wide consultation with victims and survivors could be used to inform the development of such a programme. In relation to contributions, it has been seven years since the historical institutional abuse inquiry recommended that the relevant institutions make contributions to the cost of redress and specialist services. The committee will be aware of the importance of the issue of contributions to victims and survivors. Many victims and survivors view contributions as a matter of accountability. I would note that in the seven years since the inquiry, many victims and survivors have unfortunately passed without seeing that accountability be demonstrated. I would be remiss if I did not highlight the number of victims and survivors who have also passed, many of whom their trauma directly or indirectly contributed to their passing. And in my role as Commissioner, I've been to a number of funerals of victims and survivors. And I think it's important that we recognise that these benefits, entitlements, these recommendations, many have not lived to see them happen or be realised. I've previously said that contributions needed to be understood in the overall context of reparations and acknowledgement and that urgency was needed in moving contributions forward. In addition to the financial aspects of contributions, it is fundamentally a matter of accountability. And like I said, many victims and survivors consider a matter of accountability. Um, Going forward, I suppose, you know, it's important that we realise that while we're looking at what needs to happen in relation to the inquiry, that victims and survivors are very much alive now with needs now and will have needs going into the future as they age. And so one of the issues that we've been looking at is what is, what is the future service provision, what are future service provision needs? Um, I've already said to the committee on a number of occasions that there are significant gaps in data in relation to victims and survivors we know um, from redress applications and from um, services that the majority of survivors who are seeking assistance are over the age of 50, so we can say that in good faith. What this means is that victims and survivors are an ageing population and that due regard will have to be given to the provision of ongoing services, both specialist in general, as the health risks associated with ageing intersect with the lifelong legacy of childhood abuse. Um, I've spoken to survivors and they have told me that as a result of their childhood experiences, they are genuinely afraid about entering into residential care as older persons, that their vulnerability that they've had as children makes them fear for the future. And I think if there's any way that we can reduce that fear for those survivors, then we need to actually think about how we can do that. Um, the variety of specialist services offered by the Victims and Survivors Service and its community partner, Wave Trauma Centre, have been welcomed by many victims and survivors, and those supports are making a real difference to people's lives. My office frequently um, refers to VSS and to Wave, and in turn, we receive referrals. Um, my office is preparing to launch a consultation on the current and future services needs of victims and survivors, and we'll be working with VSS and Wave Trauma to initiate that consultation. The results of this survey will help us further build on an evidence base of trauma-informed practice to support victims and survivors across the board as they move through non-specialist services and facilities. It will allow us a better insight to inform future services and will allow us to understand what has victims and survivors' experience been of services and what do they hope for the future from services. Again, I would draw your attention to the absence of data. And while this is a very modest <coughs> initiative, we're hoping that it will address at least one of the gaps that's there. So in conclusion, I suppose I would observe to the committee that victims and survivors are individuals and all are on different life journeys. I've met with a considerable number of victims and survivors at this point, and I suppose I would stress the fact that they are individuals with different life experiences. People do respond to their experiences in different ways. As a group of people, they are getting older, and the legacy of childhood abuse is going to intersect with the health risks, thanks Margaret, um, associated with ageing. When I was here in 21, I told the committee about a lady whom I'd met, a victim and survivor. If I was a little girl in an institution, she would stand at the fence and wave at passers-by, not just to be seen, but for them to acknowledge that she was really there. I suppose it's just to remind you all, victims and survivors are here right now, and they do have needs, and they will have needs going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, if you have anything to
Okay, well, thank, thanks very much. I'll just open up those questions then, and then we'll got a number members anybody else would be indicate through the clerk okay so thank you again for your for your presentation and for getting us the, the um put in writing beforehand so i just wanted to touch upon the review of the redress scheme that you outlined there and um the fact that you said that it's entered in, into its last year and i'm very conscious that we've been through a pandemic and that could well have you know um slowed down the process prevented people from engaging and maybe you know have delayed it are you getting any indication that it may be extended um, well, I suppose just to take what you said about the review with the redress scheme, obviously the review was carried out two years ago. Yeah. Um, I was one of the people who called for a review because of concerns that were being expressed to me by victims and survivors at the time. Now that review has yet to be published and so I have asked the Executive Office for a timeline regarding that publication. Um, I think it's a matter of transparency. I think it would be very useful as we are entering into the last year of redress um, for that review to be there. At the same time, um, we have been looking at progressing recommendations from the review with the likes of VSS, with the board, with TEO, in order to advance those recommendations. Um, I suppose I would observe to you from what I've seen of redress applications, there do appear to be falling since last year in terms of absolute numbers. My concern has been that we reach as many victims and survivors as possible. Um, I suppose I've said this at the start of my um, my engagement to you that um, I want to pay tribute to the victims and survivor group representatives because to be fair they're the people who've actually reached out to victims and survivors from the very start to make them aware of their entitlements and I suppose what I want to see going forward is a concerted targeted effort to create awareness around entitlements that people can make good choices for themselves about which entitlements they want to avail of and I, again, I would stress that I am very concerned that victims and survivors outside of Northern Ireland are at particular risk of not knowing what their um, entitlements are. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of the issue that you mentioned there, seven years since yes. the inquiry um, recommendation around the contributions from the institutions. Um, what involvement have you been in terms of those conversations? Um, wh why do you feel that seven years on there has been very little progress? So just to be clear, the matter of contributions has been a negotiation between the executive office and the relevant institutions. The inquiry recommendation was that the relevant institutions will make contributions to the cost of redress and specialist services. Um, what I have done is engage with the independent facilitator and then offered to put him in contact with victims and survivor groups themselves who have met with the independent facilitator in order to make their views known in relation to contributions. I have... Um, up to a few years ago, may have gone on record at saying that the issue of contributions was urgent, it was a matter of accountability, and that we really, really needed to move forward with this. Now, I'm conscious that I think I said that in 2021, and we're now here in 2024, and we're still in a situation where contributions have not been made. I said to you earlier that I think this is a matter of accountability. It's a matter of justice yeah. and accountability. Yeah, a sense of why we're still waiting, or why... What I've, been, what I've been told by the executive office yeah. was that the independent facilitator was developing a framework um, to engage with the institutions and that the TEO, the executive office, were engaging with each of the individual institutions. Okay, well, we'll, we'll pick that up with them. A last one for me quickly then. So what is the status of the memorial programme? We, we saw the headlines a few months ago around the bench here in Parliament buildings and been very little conversation around that sense or information. What is your understanding of the memorial programme? I suppose just to bring us back to the original inquiry recommendation, the inquiry recommendation was that it would be the Arts Council that would take forward the actual um, physical memorial, which was a recommendation of Sir Anthony Hart, and that they would have a broad consultation with victims and survivors and that the Executive Office would sponsor um, the memorial. Um, I think what I've observed is having engaged with I suppose, memorial teams in Australia, um, the Republic of Ireland, in Jersey, in Canada, that the idea of taking on a memorial programme is actually one that could benefit victims and survivors in terms of making more options available to victims and survivors. So to be very clear, what I recommended was a memorial programme that encompassed the physical memorial recommendation from the inquiry, but would allow other expressions of memorial um, so, for example, in the arts and heritage. And, and what is the status of that at the minute? 
in terms of the Arts Council and that work? What's your understanding? Well, my understanding is it was the Executive Office that was engaging with the Arts Council. Um, I understand that the Executive Office has engaged in consultations with victims and survivors around particular proposals. Not under, under your remit then? It's not within my remit, but I do think it's important because it's an area of interest to victims and survivors, mm -hmm. which is why I recommended a memorial programme. Thank you. I'm going to over, guys. Thank you. Go ahead, Connie. Um, yeah, thank you very much, both of you, for coming in today to, to talk to the committee. It's really appreciated. Um, I'm, I'm glad Paula asked the question around the contributions for the institutions because I think really that's not about the monetary contribution, it's about the recognition mm -hmm. um, of the harm that was caused by them. And I think it really is disappointing and concerning that they are not forthcoming with that. Um, I'm also aware that there has there many were disappointed with the apology. Um, from the institutions and also that the apology was not um, from the head of state, I'm uh, sorry, head of government, apologies, head of government due to the um, political situation at the time. Do you think and have you had any conversations with the executive office about an apology from um, the first and deputy first minister um, that will be on Hansard because I'm conscious the previous one wasn't? Um. Obviously, we engaged in an apology. Again, it's technically outside my remit, but obviously it's a matter of interest to victims and survivors. So we engaged very heavily in the original apology process. You might recall that through 20, throughout 2020, I um, supported victims and survivors in their call for an apology. I would like to say again um, that much of the progress that we have made to date in this area has been down to the victims and survivors themselves and the groups and their representatives. Um, I think in relation to the apology, we recognise that it was important, again, in terms of part of the state's acknowledgement. Um, again, it was late. Again, there are victims and survivors who have passed before they've seen apology. So the apology that went ahead, um, I think it was far from ideal. Some people, I think it's worth remembering, did not want an apology. Some people did want an apology. And on balance, um, and I think that was something the inquiry remarked on themselves, the difference of opinions, which was also there in relation to memorial. So on balance, um, we went with the apology, that I supported the apology while acknowledging in my speech the in the Assembly, or rather on the day, that, um, that there were a variety and spectrum of opinions in relation to that apology. Mm. Regarding the matter of um, apology being read into Hansard, I think that's a matter for the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. If I could have one more chair, thank you. Um, you were um, spoke a lot in your presentation there about um, the lack of data on this issue in our society. Um, how has that affected um, your delivery of services, and what do you think needs to be done to address that? And conscious, you know, your term is coming to an end. Is that something that is a missed opportunity that we hadn't done that previously? Um, I'm really glad for the opportunity to speak to that um, because it's something that I've highlighted from the beginning. I think any of us who are involved in the area of historic institutional child abuse can't help but be struck by the lack of data, by the lack of research. We don't know numbers, and that makes it very, very difficult in terms of service provision and planning. Um, one of my responsibilities is to monitor VSS, and I mean, I've engaged with VSS and spoken to them um, about that lack of data. Um, while we're not a direct service provider ourselves, we obviously um, are engaging with services so, for example, I can't, we hear figures in relation to historic and institutional child abuse, we have no way of putting them into context. We have no idea how many victims and survivors are not living in Northern Ireland, how many victims and survivors have passed. And as victims and survivors get older, their support needs will increase. And not only just for specialist services, um, the specialist services are obviously hugely important but I think VSS itself and the other special services would admit that the majority of victims and survivors are still engaging with the primary health and social care system. And so as we go forward, and particularly because I think it's really important to remind ourselves, victims and survivors are here now, they're alive now, they have needs now, mm -hmm. and they will go forward with those that we need to know more in order to make better provision, better services, in order to respond to needs. Um, so that's why I've called for a prevalence study. It could be part of a wider prevalence study in relation to child abuse. And as you can see internationally, that has been mainly carried out <coughs> excuse me, in relation to child sexual abuse. But I think historical institutional child abuse, where we do know that there were um, high instances of physical abuse, of child sexual abuse, 
um, as well as neglect and emotional abuse could factor into a wider study and I think it would also intersect and benefit some of the other um, key strategies in Northern Ireland. Um, Shanae, please. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Fiona, for, for that update. Um, I, I'm going back on the data again because I think this is really, really important um, because it's so well connected to the types of services that we need to provide um, for the future. And I, I, whilst we're talking about the Historical Institute of Abuse, it's the wider, you know, sexual abuse of children that we could actually have another crisis in front of us um, and that we need to be ready and well um, prepared for in terms of child abuse that exists um, in, in Northern Ireland. And we have to make sure that the services that we are providing for the future are, are appropriate. In what way do you think that the services now could be developed um, in order to meet the needs of those, um, you know, that the, the, those are engaging with the services because you talked about housing, for example. Yes. You talked about housing and the type of housing for people um, as they get older that, that they don't want to go into care settings again or they would want something more <coughs> enhanced. How do you believe that we could develop our FSS in order to meet the housing needs of our survivors today? I think you need to go back to the start, and I think it's a really good observation, Sinead, um, the fact that victims and survivors do have a variety of needs. We know it. They, you know, um, so as a result, we need to find out what those needs are, and that's part of why the reason why my office is going forward with that consultation. But I understand it's a qualitative mm -hmm. um, consultation. So that's why I think that quantitative, that wider piece that you're talking about would provide us with some information. Um, I think it's about taking, adopting a trauma-informed approach across um, Northern Ireland in terms of services. You know, we don't ask, why is someone like this? We go, what happened to this person? Mm -hmm. You know, and victims and survivors, particularly victims and survivors of child sexual abuse, there are traditionally and generally low disclosure rates for very good reasons, guilt, shame. We need a situation where victims and survivors can come forward. If you look at some of the remarks associated with carrying out these kind of prevalent studies, you know, they demonstrate the fact, well, one, they provide an evidence base for service providers, both statutory and non-statutory, including housing providers. But they also act to change the national conversation around child abuse, around child sexual abuse, which there tends to be a squeamishness about, in that they let victims and survivors know that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. that there are other people out there because one of the side effects of being a victim of child abuse is that incredible isolation to feel that it can feel that it's just you this has happened to so i think that's um that's one of the advantages of carrying out this type of research um i know because i've spoken to service providers who are ancillary to um while not directly providing services potentially to historic institutional child abuse survivors as in a specialist service but would obviously be ancillary, and they would tell me that it would be really important to have that awareness as well. Um, specifically in relation to housing, I mean, we have met with the housing executive, we're happy to have that conversation, but I think in the first instance, knowing the scope, the scope and the scale, um, some people will, for many different medical reasons, have to enter into residential care. So let's have those conversations with the residential care providers. Mm -hmm. But first of all, you know, let us understand what it is we're actually looking for. I'm not saying we have to wait to have the conversations for a prevalence study. If they can be progressed in parallel, but to actually recognise this is a reality. This is what's happening for people. I suppose um, it was interesting that you talked about the 2023 leaflet drop mm -hmm. and the 250 respondents that you had within three weeks of that leaflet drop and the, the, the variation, you know, not all of them. Uh, I don't know, <coughs> did you give a percentage? One in three. One in three wasn't connected to historical institute of abuse. That in itself, even it, it, it was just, um, I suppose, a small data gathering in a way, mm -hmm. um, indicates, you know, the, the, the prevalence of this in our society uh, and the impact that it's having on people's mental health and mental well-being uh, and, and certainly I would support you know gathering more data and, uh, and that wider survo survey and I suppose um, the one thing that I would say is we need to talk about it we can't sweep this under the carpet it can't be taboo and that's why we need to get it into our schools 
and that's why RSE is really, really important that people know and understand what abuse is and that, um, that, that the children are not responsible uh, and they don't have to carry this burden and we as a society need to carry them with us in order to support them. So that's no, thank you very, very much for, for that um, brief um, update. Can I add something on to, yeah. I mean, Sinead, you raised the point about, you know, victims and survivors of, um, I suppose, historic institutional child abuse and non-recent child abuse, mm -hmm. you know, engaging with um, the mental health services, physical health services, and that kind of, I suppose, segues into contributions as well, mm -hmm. because while contributions is there to cover the costs of redress and specialist services, one thing that I've observed <coughs> is that the reality is that the cost to the National Health Service is likely to be much higher than has ever been actually counted in. And um, if we look at parallel surveys from around the world or um, estimation exercises, they're likely to be considerably higher. And I suppose I'd also observe to you that it is the victims and survivors themselves who have actually paid the costs, you know, whether it is through being denied education, being denied life opportunities, um, mental health costs, they've carried the costs and this has also real very real world financial implications and i think we need to be aware of that in any conversation around contributions thank you um i'm going to carol please thank you thank you for your presentation um <clears throat> i watched the apology and i thought it was horrendous i'm just being honest i thought it was absolutely horrendous horrendous and i can't help but feel that the religious orders are taking the same approach as the state did in terms of legacy. They're trying to wait to clock down and hope that these people just go away. And it's very clear that they're not going to. But I also feel there's a rule for your office. Um, while I appreciate there's going to be, or there is an independent facilitator that's developing a framework, you know, as a commissioner, as an advocate, there does need to be a statement made in terms of um, uh, redress um, and even just concern in terms of the, the time. So I, I appreciate the negotiations about money, maybe with the department, but as an advocate, I think you have a role. So I'll just ask you to respond to that. I agree with you that I have a role and I've gone on the record in the past as saying that these um, contributions are overdue, they're urgent, and it's a matter of accountability. And I will keep repeating that. Um, I think there's an opportunity now with the um, with the with the executive and you know the restoration of the assembly to move forward to create that environment whereby we say it's time, it's time, it's overdue. Actually, it's gone beyond time. These contributions were overdue in 2017. Yeah. They're overdue now, and I can assure you, I've gone on the record, I've said that, I will repeat that, and I'm saying that here to this committee now. And I, and I appreciate that, because, I, I mean, that's our jobs as MLAs, with them when commissioners are appointed, they're the advocates. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and Furness have given um, respect to the victims and survivors themselves in terms of their own agency and what they've had to do and overcome. But I think, in terms of your office, that's extremely important, so I'm encouraged to hear what you have to say. Just in terms of the Remembrance Programme, and I'm glad you've said a programme because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the last I heard was there's supposed to be a bench tucked in the corner here somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just feel that that's just putting it away. Yeah. And I think we all do in that respect. Mm -hmm. But, so in terms of, um, is the, the remembrance programme dependent on other actions being advanced or you know what way do you envisage that being taken forward with people with the victims and the last question and it's very very quick you mentioned wave and victims and survivors in terms of trauma informed work which is really important is it just wave providing that with victims of other other trauma related groups that you're aware of so that's that's my question sure thank you Okay, I suppose I'll take them from the top. Um, in terms of memorial programme, I mean, we obviously have the inquiry recommendation, but as you very rightly say, my role is to be an advocate in this area. Mm -hmm. And it became very apparent that while some people want a memorial, some people don't. And that was acknowledged from the time of memorial. 
and even in, or the inquiry rather, and that also that there were a variety of views in relation to memorial. So in order to gather international best practice, I think I said to you, I engaged with the memorial teams in Australia and Canada, in the Republic and in Jersey. And basically, once you actually got beyond the specifics of each one, what they kept saying was, consider a memorial program because it is inclusive. It allows a variety of expressions. And I think I spoke about arts, education, living history, the idea of being there for um, victims and survivors, mm -hmm. but also as a reminder to legislators of mm -hmm. what your responsibilities are, mm -hmm. of, um, and for future generations that this wouldn't be forgotten in terms of social history. So I think from my perspective that there's an opportunity there to engage in a widespread consultation and um, to honour the inquiry recommendation, but to engage in that widespread consultation and if possible use it to inform a programme going forward. So that would be my first answer to that. Um, in relation to, um, from recollection, you said about other service providers. Um, I think from my experience, VSS and WAVE are the service that the majority of victims and survivors we would engage with would avail of. However, I am conscious, for example, that there are victims and survivors who've gone to Nexus. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken to um, the CEO of Nexus and I've asked um, for obviously because of what was happening in relation to the potential funding. cuts to yeah. funding, yeah. what was going to happen to those victims and survivors yeah. that she was supporting. Now, obviously, that situation has moved on, but I'm, um, I was on the phone quite recently again with her, and just to say that we're aware of the fact that from a trauma-informed approach, it's reliant on giving victims and survivors a choice. Exactly. And so it's very important to me that we, rather than confining services, would, and while total respect to those who are providing services, that we allow victims and survivors to have that choice. Yeah. And so, obviously, I offered my support in any way that I could. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Harry, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Fiona and Denise. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Just thinking, first of all, on the Household Leaflet Communication Initiative. I mean, that was obviously very, very useful. Do you think in the foreseeable future that should be something that maybe should happen again and as well as that are there any other means of communication happening at the minute thinking of electronic means or that if you could maybe answer that first please thank you um i think it's really really important that um we do everything we can to reach victims and survivors of historical institutional child abuse you might notice that i don't use the term hia i don't like an acronym because i think going to the points this committee has very rightly made this is about historical, institutional child abuse. If we don't use the words, then we can't create the conversation. And if we can't create the conversation, we can't create the change. So we need to actually get the message out there and create a situation where victims and survivors can come forward and are comfortable coming forward. So in relation to the leaflet drop, um, I think it had, I think it was very welcome when it happened. My own, my own um, view would be that we need an integrated marketing communications initiative going forward. Um, we're entering into the last year of redress, but I think we need to be clear that this is more than just about redress. It is about supports and services, but it is also about creating an environment where victims and survivors can come forward and say what has happened to them safely and know that they will be met with good responses. You know, so I think that going forward, rather than scaling down our communications, that we need that the executive office needs to scale up its communications, and those of us involved need to do similar. Yeah, and that means as well that it's the one and three that you need had mentioned that are outside your remit as well, that yeah. probably out there at the minute still mm -hmm. needing help. If I could just wait. No, please. Um, the two international awareness initiatives that happened lately, could you maybe tell us where they were and how would you gauge the success of these events? Um, i be very honest with you. I mean, these were very modest initiatives undertaken by my own office. So a lot of them were, um, we looked at looking at key centres, for example, in Britain, where we knew Northern Ireland victims and survivors had migrated to because with a small limited budget we were trying to make the maximum impact. So we made sure to run, say, advertisements in local newspapers, 
in London, in Manchester, in Liverpool. And then we sent out, I think it was a, something like 300 to 500 letters to um, agencies involved in supporting victims and survivors in the hope that we could engage with vic victims of historical institutional child abuse as part of their wider remit. Mm -hmm. And that's been quite useful and we've been asked over by a number of agencies again um, to engage with them. Um, we are also, I suppose we spoke to the Irish Abroad Unit through the Department of Foreign Affairs and they were very helpful in putting in co us in contact with their contacts. Um, I think the issue for us is um, in terms of trying to reach victims and survivors of historical institutional child abuse because we know there are very low disclosure rates because of the guilt and shame, many people are reluctant to come forward. It feels like sometimes like it's an iceberg, you know? And you can't help but thinking that for every person who's gained the courage to call you, that there are people who are standing in their kitchens wondering, can we reach out, can we call, is it safe? Um, we've had some unexpected successes as well in terms of um, most recently, having sent out um, letters again, to um, we sent them out to ambassadors, um, to um, you know anyone we thought basically to make them aware, and so we've basically um, been contacted by the Australian ambassador to Ireland, and we've been contacted by the special advocate which has been appointed in the Republic of Ireland to have further conversations. I am going to do everything that I can in the time that I have in office to reach out to victims and survivors, but I'm conscious of the limitations of my own office, but I'm going to do everything I can within the um, resources that I have to do that. Is it just think, just a final yeah. comment? I think of what you said. I mean, uh, some of the people that kept the letters or leaflet for a week, three weeks or whatever, while it was good that they did make contact, we have to really be mindful of those that haven't or haven't been able to, you know? Absolutely. And we, we by, I think by renewing our communications efforts, yep. we signal to them that we still want to hear from them. This wasn't a once-off. We want to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Emma, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you both for your presentation and apologies at the outset for, for being slightly late. I got held up on another meeting. My um, question sort of relates to the, the point that Harry and, and Sinead were making earlier. That was the, the thing that stuck out to me in the presentation, <clears throat> the fact that you did this leaflet drop and a third of those who contacted you in the immediate aftermath didn't fall within the remit of this particular scheme. Um, so, uh, like, even us who are, in, and I was in this committee before, um, even us who are involved in this and familiar with it, there's, I feel like, you know, within wider society, there's a lack of understanding of the difference between, you know, historical institutional abuse, the mother and baby homes, and then other sorts of institutions where abuse occurred, but not in a context that falls within the remit of this particular scheme. So I know that, that you have stated that there was signposting and support offered to these people. I wonder if you could talk me through what that actually consisted of. And I'm very aware that even like in, in the work that we do in dealing with constituents around like the benefits, the impact that it has on a person when they apply for something and are told that they are not eligible and the 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 whole journey that a person goes through then in 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 the wake of that and that they're not vindicated that their suffering is not recognized and all the implications that that has and this I suppose is an even more extreme version of this these are obviously people who did not understand that the abuse that they suffered is the, is what you're trying to address um so I, I like I'm really concerned because those people obviously mm -hmm. felt that this information resonated with them and so where are they going to turn to and the second thing that I, I, I wondered about was obviously we know and it's been referred to before and, and Carl uh, was asking you there around the sort of trauma informed aspect of this and the, the organisations that are that are, are dealing in, in that regard this is obviously intergenerational there are going to be people who were never in an institution themselves but somebody belonging to them was and it has far reaching consequences and we know that that you know throughout Irish society there are families that have been impacted by this who never themselves experienced it and I wondered if you've had any interactions with people who are the loved one the child the grandchild of somebody who was affected and how you have responded to that or where they sit in terms of your remit and your responsibility sorry 
Not at all. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about it. Um, I suppose just first of all to put on the record, the leaflet drop that I'm referring to was the one um, that was the household leaflet drop that was, um, it was actually the executive office carried it out and ourselves and VSS, our contact details were on the leaflet which is why people contacted us in the first instance. So just to make sure yeah. about that. Um, I suppose I want to be very clear as well um, that two out of three people who did contact our office were within the remit of historical <laughs> institutional child abuse and their concerns, their um, queries were primarily around how they could access redress and how they could access services and so we were able to proceed with those. I think that's very important that, you know, because mm -hmm. I am the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Child Abuse, that um, we actually um, underline that fact. I think we were as surprised as anyone else by the one in three during that period. And I think it probably speaks to the fact that it was a general household initiative. So you're actually reaching the general population. I think to your question, you might find this interesting, that while people called us and some of them were surprised that they weren't in remit and said, but hang on a minute, I was abused. I was abused in a particular setting. And then to have to explain that someone wasn't. And I'm sure, as you said yourself, working on a constituency basis, just the devastation. But I think how my staff approach it is basically to acknowledge, to listen and to know, to believe. Yeah. Yes. And that's really important. And then to say, OK, this is what's available. These are the services that are available that are there. But I suppose to be careful with the fact as well, I mean, there we are a 10-person NDPB. We're a 10-person organisation. And um, so we take the approach to be trauma-informed, to be empathetic, to be human, to just listen. Um, interestingly, people said to us, I know I'm not in your remit, but I just want someone to hear me. I want to tell someone this happened to me. And I think that's really powerful as well. And we, like I said, we weren't expecting it, but we, again, we listened, we engaged with, us, with empathy, and we, as best as we could, um, directed them to appropriate services. In terms of the services that are available, I mean, there are the immediate specialist services, and then there are those services, you know, that are the crisis services. There are the primary health care services. There are other forms of specialist services, you know, like mental health services, or, and we spoke about um, Nexus as well. So I think to understand that it's sort of at the risk of sounding a very trendy term, an ecosystem that uh, we're trying to navigate at any one time around services. But to understand that, um, I suppose, the issue of child abuse is a wide one. It's one that affects all, affects all levels of society in different places <coughs> and victims and survivors of historical institutional child abuse um, are part of that wider grouping but have very specific needs in their own right because of their experiences of institutional child abuse. Yes. Is, did I answer, is there anything else that... Um, yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. Mm. It's just the, the, those people who themselves, yeah. I, I'm imagining there are people that have contacted you who they themselves might not have been in an institution, but maybe someone, yes. uh, and, and maybe somebody even deceased. And I just wonder what the response to those individuals is or w what way you're... It depends on the nature of the query. Okay. Um, so I've had, I've met with um, families of victims of survivors. Yes. So for example, the victim of survivor might have come in with their partner or their son and daughter. And I think, you know, you were talking about transgenerational trauma. I think there's that element of transgenerational responsibility. And it's so moving because you see the sons and daughters of victims and survivors and they want to be their mums and dads advocate. And they want to they want justice for their mums and dads and you know it's so important to acknowledge that as well that you know the while the individual experiences the abuse that it has a you know a ripple effect across the generations and that sense of i suppose almost responsibility to ensure that um like anyone would that your your mum or dad or your partner are actually being supported getting the entitlements that they deserve. So um, so I have met with the sons and daughters and with the partners of victims and survivors 
and um, it's very powerful. And you can see the sense of responsibility and sometimes the weight of that responsibility on them. Mm-hmm. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Claire, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for coming through. You know, really inspirational, powerful kind of conversation that we're having here, and I hope it does have that impact um, on the executive office to do more in the time that you know has passed since. And certainly, I'm very conscious that we are the scrutiny committee of the executive office. And is there anything that we could do as a committee to, I suppose? Put that pressure on the executive office to to move that work maybe forward more quickly or, or more forcefully. Um, you know, conscious of you know press statements that were made today, and I agree with that. You know, we we, we do need to push this on. Um, I suppose I'm going to come back to themes that other um, members um, have have talked about. Um, the one that I'm really interested in and have been for a number of years is the trauma informed practice. Um, and I suppose my question to you would be, you know, I, I very much get the sense that you understand what that means, and it is very much about looking at all aspects of policy, whether it's housing, whether it's benefits, whether it's community development, and recognising that th- those people will have a different perspective because of that trauma. Um, I'm not quite sure that the executive office in itself gets that. You know, I, I submitted an assembly question earlier this week and was actually pushed back on it and told to go to each department. Um, where, where I was frustrated and I did push back and say no this needs to be an approach which has to happen right across the board um, so I, I, I'm not quite sure that they get it and I do want, worry sometimes that it's a, tick, a, a box ticking exercise so I'd be you know, uh, interested to know how, how do we nearly compel government departments to do it because they're not quite getting it mm-hmm. and um, my second point again is on that, that one and three you gave them an avenue you know, it might not have been the most appropriate avenue, and I'm not entirely surprised that those people were not, you know, that didn't know what, you know, what the, the, the your service was about and how it wasn't necessarily appropriate for them. But it makes me feel that the other avenues that exist are are, are not something that they were prepared to go to or maybe didn't know about or, or anything. But it is a prevalent issue within society, whether it's institutional or whether it's domestic, ultimately. Um, so I suppose really. You, you conducted a process that maybe other departments haven't done in, in trying to get those people to, 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 to reveal that or, or to, to finally talk. And is that a lesson for other departments in, in the nature of domestic abuse, if, if that's what we're talking about? And I'm also conscious as well that are people coming to you who maybe weren't abused in, a, in an institutional setting, but the people who abused them might have been in positions of leadership and responsibility? And then that has an impact. So it's not necessarily the setting, but it's actually the nature of the person who did it and their standing within the community, I suppose. So a lot there. So. Okay, I suppose I'll take it in reverse order. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose, first of all, the one in three callers, like I was saying, who did contact my office, um, were disclosing um, child abuse in different contexts. So um, it wasn't adult domestic abuse. Okay. Um, my background is in domestic sexual mm-hmm. and gender based violence. So. Um, I'm just making that distinction for clarity. Um, So I suppose that's the first instance. The second instance is it goes back again to our lack of data in relation to prevalence across the population. Certainly that number of people came to me, but I don't know how many people are going to different organisations and disclosing their experiences. I think because it was a general campaign with my address on it or my contact details along with VSSs, Mm -hmm. that we obviously were contacted by people who either didn't know or did know and were just seeking support and seeking Mm acknowledgement. And I think that's really important that we understand that. In terms of um, what you were saying, uh, a whole of government approach, which I think is what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mm -hmm. Um, I think that has worked um, relatively successfully in other jurisdictions. For example, if I could just share with the committee, um, the, in the Republic of Ireland, the, um, the latest sexual violence um, prevalence study came out um, last year. It came out under the auspices of the de- domestic sexual and gender-based violence strategy, which is led by Department of Justice, but you know has an oversight, I think, for Department of, on Taoiseach and has representatives from all different government departments on it. And it has provided a use of a baseline. It's the successor to the SAVI report. And as a result, what it was able to do was provide a prevalence analysis across the Republic of Ireland of the incidence of um, non-contact and contact um, sexual violence, both for adults and children. And one of the interesting parts of the survey where it was relating to people who had experienced contact, non-contact sexual violence as a child was who carried out 
that abuse. Mm -hmm. And I think that gave a really good indication of potentially where that abuse had been carried out. But that was very much the result of a whole of government national strategy backed um, by a government department that had serious stakeholder engagement at each stage. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, when you're talking about that kind of infrastructural commitment, mm -hmm. that kind of systemic commitment to identifying, naming this issue and having a conversation about it, having a national conversation, then I think that's what you're important. That's what I, I'm getting from what you're saying. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I suppose it was really more from the perspective of a trauma-informed approach. Um, I, I'm not sure that each department recognises their responsibilities in that respect, whether it's communities or justice or health or, 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 or anything. Um, and, and I do feel that the approach has to be that because it's dealing with members of society who you know, have to go about their daily lives and all those things affect them. But it's the trauma that has to be considered as part of that. Um, so, I think, the, I think the further we get away from, um, and I would say this just in general across any form of um, social issue, the further we get away from a sort of siloed mentality where we think that it is purely the responsibility for these, um, I suppose, uh, social issues, quite complex social issues, mm -hmm. that it is purely the responsibility of one government department without recognising, well, it may be the lead, that there needs to be a significant involvement from others, mm -hmm. then we're not going to actually get that overall systemic progress mm -hmm. that we need to make a difference. Yeah. Okay. of time. Thank you. So we've got Brian. Patrick, do you want to come in? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Brian and then Patrick. Yeah. Okay, Ruth, thank you, Commissioner, uh, for Fiona for coming in today, and Denise, your staff member, and others who are here as well, uh, who I know have played a role uh, in campaigning on this issue. Um, and uh, thank you for the <coughs> practical support that you're providing and also that personal support and advice uh, uh, but also the recognition that you're giving to people and I think you're giving people their dignity mm -hmm. by being recognised and uh, I notice that there's outstanding work there to be done uh, that we will continue to push for and to take up uh, I accept entirely the apology did not happen in the way that it should have and that was less than it should have been and to do with the circumstances at that time, but I think some of the others were, were present here uh, at that time. Um, so, uh, I know, as I say, I note those uh, outstanding works, uh, the whole issue of the memorial, <coughs> memorial programme, uh, the, the culpability of the institutions, um, I, very much that's an outstanding matter. It's not just about the money, but it's about the recognition uh, and and accepting responsibility uh, and for people who they let down and uh, who are entitled to see that they're facing uh, their, their culpability. Um, so I don't think I have any questions. You, you've answered a lot that's been put to you. Uh, but as I say, I notice though, I will note those issues that, that, that we should continue to work on and also welcome what you've said, how you've Try to highlight the wider issue of, of child abuse, you know, and uh, raising awareness that, uh, which is a major issue within society uh, that needs constantly needs attention. Okay, thank you. Did I just observe that? Um, I mean, in the matter of contributions, I think it's a matter of, as I've said to you, it's about accountability. It is not just the financial. It is a matter about acknowledgement, about validation, mm -hmm. and it is about recognizing the harm that was done and being seen to be accountable. It is part of, I think, a reparations framework to victims and survivors. And it is overdue. Mm -hmm. And it's been overdue for a long time. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Patrick. Um, firstly, thank you for your, your presentation. I want to come back to a point which um, you've already gone into some detail on, but it, it's just to come back to it again. Um, and that's on victims who are living outside the North. Um, I'm conscious that there, there is definitely a... I suppose a, a difficulty and increased difficulty in reaching those people who are isolated um, in terms of firstly the, their connection fr from here but, but obviously physically isolated in terms of how you get that information to them as well. Um, I'm also con very conscious within that that there are such constraints on your resource, on your budget um, and I'm just wondering how uh, as an executive office committee um, we, we can support your, your office um, in, in terms of that. What do you see as, as the next steps in, in reaching those people 
Um, and obviously you've already mentioned in, in detail the difficulties in, in doing so, but I'm, I'm just conscious to hear if there's anything else to add to that as well. I suppose first of all to give the victims and survivor groups their place. They were the first people ever before I came um, into office to reach out to victims and survivors outside of Northern Ireland. And there were many victims and survivors outside of Northern Ireland who would never have even heard <coughs> excuse me, of their entitlements if it wasn't for the victims and survivor groups and the communications efforts that they made to reach out. So I suppose you asked as a committee, and I'm very gratified that this committee is, um, would consider this to be a major issue, because I do. And I know, speaking to victims and survivors um, themselves and victim survivor group representatives, that they are concerned that victims and survivors outside of Northern Ireland, and indeed in Northern Ireland, are not getting to hear about their entitlements. So I suppose in the first instance, it's recognising that there's a need to reach out, you know? And second of all, resourcing that need to reach out. Now, I want to be clear to the committee, because as you say, you are the scrutiny committee. I can't guarantee this committee that if you spend X amount of money, you will get Y amount of survivors applying for redress or going for services. I can't guarantee you that in terms of return on investment, you know, which is what our impact in terms of how this is measured. What I can guarantee you is that if you don't do it at all, you won't have any coming forward. And I don't think that's good enough for victims and survivors, and I don't think it's good enough. These people have already suffered. They've fled where they're from. They've cut ties with family, friends and communities because of the trauma that was done to them. It's not good enough that we kind of look away and say, well, they're no longer living here. This is our opportunity to say, we have not forgotten you. You are remembered, and we will reach out to you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. That was a really strong point to end on there, and oh, sorry, um, uh, Fiona and, and Denise. So we really, really appreciate your your time today. Um, we have got two more presentations. You're very welcome to stay in the gallery and, and listen in. Um, so if you just take your ease, members, for a minute, we'll just change over there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. I'm going to open a window. I think, we've, I think we were, but I think we need to be more. <laughs> it's very warm in here. Yes. Isn't it? I'm going to melt. Oh, happy days. I'm not ready to run. What's the ready to run, oh my lord? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So can, I, I'll, can we move forward with our yes, second yes. panel? Thank you. Okay, so um, members, the clerk's brief is on page... Okay, no problem. Um, the clerk's brief is on page 54, and on page 53, <coughs> you'll find um, a letter from Cyril Glass of Survivors Together and noting his will willingness to engage with the committee and his reasons for not being able to attend today, but just to assure you he was invited and we will try to engage with him in the future. So members, we're going to um, ask Jerry McCann from the Rosetta Trust to come forward, Professor Patricia Lundy of Ulster University and I think John the Court is just coming in now and he is here as a representative of Ivers North West. Members, we, uh, we went over slightly there just by a couple of minutes but we have about 40 minutes for this session so if you want to make some remarks, and then we will have some questions, but it'll be a slightly reduced session for this part. So, so I'm not sure who wants to lead. Thank you. Hello, Nana. First of all, thanks um, for inviting us on, and welcome to all of the new members of the committee okay. who we haven't met before, and yeah. welcome you. again to all of those we have met previously. Um, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Patricia open. I'll let Jerry follow on and then I'll come in behind and we'll take all the questions here if, that's, if that works for you. Just um, before you go on, feel free to reference the previous panel and pick up on any points you want. So. Yeah. Hi, I'm Patricia Lundy, Professor of Sociology at Ulster University and I've worked with survivor groups for the past decade or more. I've also researched extensively 
um, historical institutional abuse in terms of what survivors want from redress, but also a detailed analysis of the heart inquiry itself from the survivor's perspective. And so I would just like to, to start off by saying, you know, when we think of a memorial, we think of, well, what is a memorial for? Who is it for? And what's its purpose? And so a memorial, in the first instance, is for the survivors, of course, pay tribute, acknowledgement, and so on. But I think also there's a wider, a wider purpose for memorials. And that is about wider society. It's about raising awareness. And that's come up in the previous, previous discussion. So it is about raising awareness about institutional abuse. Um, and I think a bench really does not meet those, those needs, I have to say. Um, I think it's important that we look maybe at international examples, because there's some brilliant international examples to show us you know, how this can be done. I think Fiona's point about a programme of work is absolutely crucial, mm -hmm. and I'm going to come back to that point in a minute. Um, I think if we look even closer to home, if we look at the Republic of Ireland, we can see that the government has proposed a site of conscience in a former Magdalene um, place in McDermott Street. And that will be a museum that will tell the story of institutional abuse. It will also be a site of remembrance and it will be a site of research because there will be an archive as well. So there's many, many different aspects to it. And my point in raising that is there's many different ways to do this, but I think it's crucial that it is about raising public awareness. It is about documenting that hidden history that dark and difficult hidden history. So looking in from it from, from the outside in many ways, I think, and I have met with the TEO along with, with, with Jerry from Rosetta Trust, and I think it would be useful perhaps for the TEO to consider developing a strategy, a memorial strategy, um, and I think that would incorporate the programme of work. Um, and of course it's not simply about the heart inquiry, the institution abuse, there's other inquiries coming down the line. We have the mother and baby institutions, we have the Magdalene, and we also may also have the clerical abuse. So a programme of work, yes, but I think a strategy around memorialisation is important. But the key point that I want to make in that is that it should be co-designed, co-designed, and I can't emphasise that enough, by survivors. I don't think it's enough just to call on individuals, chat to them about maybe strategy or talk to them about proposals for a bench or whatever. That, that's not really the way in which things sh should be done. I think you need to have a co-created approach and that's survivors around the table really is in, in collaboration with the TEO as, as, as partnership of equals in many ways. And I don't think they have that role. I really don't. I think there's a lot of talk about... Um, uh, victim-centred processes. I've yet to see a victim-centred process, I have to say. So, so that, that, that's my contribution to, to maybe perhaps the memorial and to point to, as I say, there's proposals in the Republic of Ireland for, for a site of conscience, which does address those issues about raising the wider issues. But I also have pursued in my work, along with Amnesty International, the issue of prosecutions. And I think it's something that hasn't come up in our discussion so far. Um, I submitted a Freedom of Information request just after the inquiry, uh, the Heart Inquiry, and that was in late uh, 17, I think it was September 17. And what came back from that uh, Freedom of Information request was there were 190 complainants or cases that were referred to the PSNI. And from that, there were 77 of those cases that went to the PPS for consideration for prosecution. We then asked for a meeting with the, with the PSNI to, to, you know, to push this forward to see what had happened to those cases, how they were processed, and the support services that were put in place for survivors. So after many um, letters and emails to the PSNI, we eventually got a meeting, probably I think it would say maybe two years later, but we did have a meeting with the PSNI um, in 2022, and that's myself and Amnesty International. And w what we found from, from that meeting was that there had been a special unit set up to, uh, to deal with those institutional abuse cases, and it's the Historical Child Abuse Team, um, and that was set up in 2020. Now, it was very difficult to get clarification from the PS, and I absolute clarification, because we talked about data earlier, you know, to get absolute clarification on the cases that had been brought forward from the Heart Inquiry. But I will, I will read you what was given to us 
um, um, in writing. So there were 297 referrals from the Heart Inquiry. Um, and some recent, fairly recent cases from the Redress Board. Um, and from that, 97, so it's not really different from, from my earlier Freedom of Information, so the 97 were referred to the PPS. But from that, um, there were 85 non-prosecutions. Um, there was a lack of evidence, passage of time, and a very, very high percentage of survivors pulled out of the process. And I, I was actually struck by, I think it was 60% or more of those survivors pulled out. And I think that actually relates back to maybe rape cases and so on where, where you know, survivors do find it a very, very difficult process to engage in. But I think that really is something that needs to be addressed and I would urge the committee you know, to, to look into that because there needs to be support services put in place for those survivors who are brave enough mm -hmm. to take their cases forward in terms of prosecutions. Um, so there was 11 prosecutions. We couldn't figure out what, what, what the... What, the outcome of those prosecutions were, whether they were successful, the length of sentence, what those those crimes were, was it sexual abuse or physical abuse? We just we, we couldn't pin that down, um, and there was one caution. So the takeaway for me and all of that is, there's very few prosecutions. There are, uh, there's been millions of pounds spent on inquiries. We know it has been absolutely, without doubt, clarified that there was systemic abuse sexual, physical and emotional, and yet we have very few prosecutions. We also have the issue of corporate responsibility, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. is the issue of information not being forwarded to the authorities, and really you could call that cover-up, brushing it under the carpet, whatever term you want to use. We asked that question of the PSNI, had they thought about engaging in some kind of inquiries into that corporate responsibility, and they said not at this point. So uh, I think there's some questions that need to be asked about prosecutions, and that is a crucial part of justice, of course, and accountability and culpability. So, so I think it's, it's an important thing, and, and it, it is very rarely raised. And just to finish on one point, and that is around the contributions from the church or churches or religious orders. And it seems to me if there are negotiations going on for many years, my uh, suggestion would be that you ask the religious orders for an interim payment, at the very least, to demonstrate their commitment to redress and to show survivors that they will eventually you know, contribute fully to that, to that process. So um, I know that John and, and Jerry will take up those points that I've initially raised, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Jerry? Well, thanks so much, Sinead. I know you previous chair president. Um, Jerry McCann was out of trust. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thanks very much for giving us the opportunity. Um, I have a number of issues which I feel from previous committees are because of the political instability. Uh, it's been collateral damage on all the groups who've been working very, very hard, and therefore there's been a slow implementation of the Hearts Report, which is now seven years old. I'm sorry, Hart unfortunately passed away two years after the report. And um, we're now seeing the final hurdle of the piece of the jigsaw, which is the memorial. But I want to go back to the apology, and I know it was mentioned earlier on. Um, and I, I think with the optics being that the apology was done two years ago, on the 11th of March 2022, and the executive had collapsed, but the apology was going ahead. That was advanced notice before the executive collapsed that the apology was going ahead. And I feel that there was a lost opportunity for a genuine, sincere apology by the state. Okay? And unfortunately, that was compounded by the religious orders apology, which really was empty, cold, harsh. I think all the groups certainly agree with that. Um, and I know from my point of view, and I know speaking to John and Patricia, and I spoke to Fiona Commissioner, that I felt we needed to put the apology on official footing in terms of Hansard, okay, which was done through the Chair of Paula and I also through the Speaker of uh, Edwin, um, that it was put on a, a official footing, but yet no media coverage of it. Yet all this optics two years ago, where we didn't have an executive in place, 
and all the media were, were, were given this. And I can understand putting that out there and let the public know there's an apology going out. But the bottom line was, it wasn't a state apology. And I feel it as a, a survivor, we were cheated. I didn't get that apology I was looking for and what, what survivors were entitled to have. And I know what the best intentions of the, 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 this committee and other uh, cross-party, that they were disappointed as well. It didn't turn out the way it should have had. Okay, so I just want to put that out there. Okay, um, in, in terms of the memorial, and um, if anybody looks into chapter four, the recommendations, and particularly page 230 and 231, it makes reference to the memorial, okay, which Sonny Hartz had suggested he wanted a, a structure uh, where the arts, the arts Council would be commissioned to design it with uh, tenders going in and putting designs in and so forth, and then for survivors, not groups, but survivors, to have agreed in terms of the design, that the number of designs that may come forward. Now, at no stage has the Art Council engaged with Rosetta, and I'm sure the other groups as well, that they, they're still waiting as far as I can see from TOE, and I think the TOE are playing Typical, I would say, civil service approach here, where they'll do nothing but to be seen that we'll do the best we can, we'll navigate, whatever. Um, that I feel that the memorial for us, that when a bench was muted to Rosetta by TOE, that was August last year. And where that idea came from, I don't know. But if there was to go out to the Arts Council for them to put out the tenders, designers to design, whether it be a bench or stained glass window or whatever the case may be, that hasn't emerged. And I feel that a bench is not suitable or appropriate in terms of the journey that these surveyors have had. Over the seven, last seven years, how many survivors have died? It, it, you, you couldn't count them. Who never got their apology who would never see the memorial, who never saw redress. And I feel, uh, uh, as a group leader, that we're trying to get this, pull this together and get it finalised and done properly. And I would like the memorial has to be done properly because now we've got a functioning executive. Let's get this jigsaw right because all the elements weren't right. I mean, we got the redress up, running up in 2020, but the Victim Support Service didn't run up till the end of the... 2020 itself, so the, re the Victim Support Service should have been up and running once the report was done. You know, so yet again, it's the cart before the horse here. And yet, we the groups having to do all the chasing and all the fighting and all the campaigning. It's, it's, it's exhausted me, and I'm sure John, Morgan, and Sarah, and, and all the groups have they've exhausted them all. But I feel it would be inappropriate and insensitive that this bench goes ahead in phase one. Now, how this programme came about was through consultation that I've been liaising with John and Patricia and um, TOE. There should be a wider programme. So they brought these various mechanism phases in, but we must get phase one done because it's Hart's recommendation to put a structure in. Well, the bench doesn't fit it. And that's where we're, basically where we're coming from. Uh, and I, I feel the fact that we do have an opportunity Let's get it right. And just before I, I would pick up, just pick up on a point that Jerry made, um, the recommendation of the bench in the rotunda, um, Sir Anthony Hart's recommendation says that the memorial is to remind legislators and others of what happened in these institutions. The uh, bench is going to be placed in the rotunda, which is an area of this building which isn't directly accessible to members of the general public. So it's not accessible. It may be, reg it may be accessible to members of uh, the legislators going in to, into or coming out of, the, um, out of the chamber, but it's not accessible except you're on an official tour with, with Storm and <coughs> um, to other members, uh, to members of the public. Um, sorry, sorry, John. Jerry, Just John, not before, I want to say in terms of events per se, we don't disagree. But I think in terms of phase one, which will go out to the media because it's already been exposed two months ago that we're doing a bench. Now, that should not be taken as red. And not only that, but the fact that the TUE had two uh, consultation events 
both in Belfast and Derry. Well, I'll give you a number. 4,200 have went through the redress. And if there's, any, if there's even 100 went to those two events, which is very considerably high, I don't think that's a fair representation of the voices of survivors of what they want. I think that needs to be put on record. Thank you. Um, from a meeting held in Castle Buildings in 2010 with junior ministers, and the OFM, OFM, DFM, as it was then, task force lead and staff, a quote. The institutions have been put on notice to make arrangements to meet their financial obligations in the event that redress or compensation are included in the recommendations of any future inquiry. That was in 2010. We're now 14 years down the road. 12 years after the historic institutional abuse legislation was passed in the Assembly Chamber, 10 years since the inquiry opened in Banbridge, 7 years since the, institutional abuse, the historic institutional abuse inquiry released its report containing its outlined key recommendations. Any vol uh, outlined a, a key recommendation. Any voluntary institution found guilty of systemic failings should be asked to make an appropriate financial contribution to the overall cost of the HIA Redress Board and any specialist services. Fourteen years after the initial assurance that institutions had been put on notice, and with 12 months left before the Redress Board can accept its last application in line with its five-year remit. An excess of over of £90 million has been awarded to victims and survivors of historical institutional abuse by the Redress Board since it received its first application in April 2020. That was three months after the then First Minister, Arlene Foster, stated, I think it is incumbent on those institutions to step forward, not only in a moral way, but indeed in terms of financial redress as well, and that is something that we will continue to take up. Since then, not one penny has been forthcoming from any of the institutions that were, in the words of Sir Anthony Hart, found guilty of systemic failings. Mm -hmm. I was reminded recently, actually by Jerry, of Sir Anthony Hart stating in the early stages of the inquiry that it had the statutory powers to allow the historical institutional abuse inquiry to be effective and mindful of the public purse. Yet, to date, the total burden of redress is coming solely from the public purse, i.e. the taxpayer. At a time when public services are stretched to capacity through lack of resources, cutbacks in the health service, <coughs> particularly mental health provision, which many victims and survivors of historical, on which many victims and survivors of historical institutional abuse depend, surely it is time to press the institutions to step up and contribute significantly to the overall cost of redress and any specialist services. We believe we're beyond the point of asking these institutions to make arrangements to meet their financial obligations, or asking them again to make an appropriate financial contribution. Any contribution should not be viewed just through the fiscal lens, but should be significantly punitive to reflect the harms done and acknowledge the pain and suffering of victims and survivors. While accepting that some of the institutions may, may no longer exist, many of those institutions have the financial means to do so. For example, the Sisters of Nazareth, who some years ago dropped the poor prefix from their title, according to their annual report in 2022 to March 2023, show their income from investments alone at £561,730. One of two sites of former children's homes has a listed value of £1 on that same report. One of those two sites, one of those two sites has, been, has been developed into a residential care village Built on a prime seafront site, Edgecombe Court, Plymouth, has 45 mixed-size <laughs> two- and three-bedroom apartments, according to local state, estate agents, they're really hard to get. The original guide price was £149,000 for one bedroom, 
265,000 for two bedroom and 520,000 pounds for a three bedroom penthouse with a sea view and a terrace. But without doubt, the use of trusts and accountants will keep this and many other assets, including the sale of Nazareth properties in Belfast and Derry, Nazareth House in Bishop Street and Termin Baca and its 195 acres of land. It w the, uh, accountants and trusts will prevent those being used to meet the financial burden. I would urge those present to question the wisdom of entering into a voluntary arrangement with the institutions and agreeing that an early date to identify them from future costs. That was an expensive mistake made in the 26 counties where the cost of redress had exceeded 1.5 billion euro and the institutions pledged in 2009 352 million euro in cash and assets that they themselves valued and weren't independently valued. And a further 128 million euro in 2002 as part of a legally binding indemnity, agree indemnity agreement protecting them from any future civil cases. Although initially agreeing to a 50-50 split, only 480 million euro has been realized, leaving a shortfall of 270 million euro that the state has to make up. It would not be something we would want to see repeated. To suggest a voluntary contribution against an undetermined top line of the total cost of redress and future cost of specialist services without any safeguard or penalty would be an act of folly. Read the HIA report. That's it there. That's the first volume of it. There are 10 volumes. There are 2,300 pages. I have the daily transcripts of every day in Banbridge stacked up under a pile that high. Reach for any one of those and see the cost to victims and survivors of that experience. And you can't equate that with money or property or trusts or accountants or any of the rest of it. This is about an acknowledgement. This isn't about paying people off. And if it's about anything now, with one year left to go with the redress process before its mandate runs out, this is about the provision of services for, for the future. More so about the provision of services for the future. Um, sorry. And in looking at that report, be reminded of what happened to vulnerable children while on so-called care and the care of these institutions and realize that what happened in these children's homes was criminal. The outcome of that report shows that criminality took place, not isolated incidents at the hands of one or two bad apples. This was, or this was organized and coordinated. The Scottish Abuse Inquiry put on record something that was long suspected and conversations with children who were in other homes run by the Sisters of Nazareth across Ireland and England, Scotland, Australia, and Canada. They had a directory, of book, a, a directory and book of customs published, which was distributed to every member of the order. As well as outlining the core values of the order, patience, hospitality, love, respect, compassion, justice. It also had instructions on the use of Jay's fluid for bathing, corporal punishment, severe corporal punishment, including whooping and caning. And children were trained to sleep with their hands outside the blankets crossed on their chest to commend themselves to the Blessed Virgin. The inquiry chair in Scotland reports that even in their sleep, children were subjected to rigorous discipline. This is. These are some of the methods used in one of their homes in, the, in every one of their homes in the north. So this was coordinated. This, for want of a better word, was a conspiracy. Why is it not being treated as such? Why are requests going in instead of demands? To meet the needs of victims and survivors right now. Taken with all the other abuses that happened in these institutions, what happened was criminal. And when I asked at the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, uh, could legal action not be taken to seize or freeze the assets of the institutions responsible until redress was resolved, Desmond Swain said, this is absurd. We do not, we do not use acts of attainder anymore. 
Ministers and politicians cannot order institutions to hand over their assets. That was in Westminster on the 10th of July, 2019. What a strange turn of events when in January this year, two Conservative MPs didn't seem to agree with his opinion. On the post office scandal, Alex Chalk, the Justice Secretary, said, if a statutory inquiry into the saga finds the scale of incompetence is as we imagine, the government would want to secure proper re recompense on behalf of the taxpayer. Jake Berry, former Minister of State, there is a lot of compensation being paid out. I don't see why it should really be the British taxpayer. And that's why I'm calling on the government to get Fujitsu to stump up the cash. A complete reversal of the attitude of Derek Swain a couple of years earlier. Now, on a separate point, I welcome the news that the first meeting of the North, of the North South Ministerial Council took place in Armagh this week. I want this committee to know that from the 1940s to the 1960s, around 30% of the children who were in homes in Derry were placed by social workers, by local social workers, or by party, parish priests in neighbouring Donegal. They were sent across the border, shipped across the border, abandoned and conveniently forgotten by the state and the church. De facie ex animo, out of sight, out of, out of mind. mind. Mm -hmm. But while the redress process closed in the 26 counties, they never had access to it anyway, because they were not in an institution mm -hmm. in the 26 counties. However, we would ask that a conversation be opened through the North South Ministerial Council to seek recognition for those children and what they went through as a result of their involuntary displacement. I ask members of the committee to remember that even when the last application has been adjudicated and the total cost established, future care of victims and survivors will need to be met. And surely it's not too, too much to ask that all of those responsible contribute to meeting that future care. While many of us are now in our 60s and 70s, remember that if someone was 16 years of age, on the last day that the inquiry were looking into, which was 1996, they are now 44 years of age. They have a lifetime of care that's going to need to be looked for. And between these young ones and us oldies, that care and specialist services, as, as, as recommended by Sir Anthony Hart, will come as, as a significant cost over and above the cost of redress awards, a cost which we believe the institutions should pay an, equi an, an equitable amount, amount, and at this point, no cap be placed on what their contribution should be, because nobody knows what the cost of care is going to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, members of the committee. Sorry, I took a bit longer than I no, thought. No, it no, thank you so much, Yes, I, I really appreciate the research and the, the detail you went into today, because I think for some of us, we'd forgotten a, a lot of a lot of that, especially the issue there about the putting on notice in 2010. Um, so, so, so thank you again. I suppose um, I, I just wanted to come back, Jerry, to yourself around the issue of the apology. Um, so, I, I wrote to the um, executive office and after we met and asked for that apology. And I suppose we were all taken by surprise that it happened in the way that it did in the chamber. I wasn't. I thought that it was going to be something slightly more formal. So we're happy to go. I'm certainly happy to go back, and and relay your concerns and, and aspiration for what it, it should look like. And I, I think it would take your point, Patricia, around it being um, victim centred mm -hmm. and, and an involvement in it. So thank you for for clarifying and giving us the your feedback on that. Um, I suppose I'm going. I'm conscious of time, so I'm actually going to move on to other members. But genuinely, I really, really appreciate. It. And I was thinking ahead there. I'm going to watch back your contributions again and take a lot more notes. But I was just so transfixed by what you said there. So thank you so much. So Connie, be any? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you all for coming in today. But you know, especially you know, telling us your lived experience and how the impact of this has had on you and others that you represent. It's, it's really powerful. So thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you coming in today. And I think the only thing I wanted to talk a wee bit more around again is that memorial. Um, conscious, um, Patricia, you had mentioned this as well, but um, I think it it's important that we recognise that the bench maybe isn't supported or felt appropriate by uh, many victims and survivors. And just if you had anything further or if you'd support for example the commissioner's proposal for a program and another form of memorial if you think that would be more appropriate 
I think a programme is the way to go forward because, you know, you're not going to please everybody. Mm. We, we understand that. Um, and going with Sir Anthony Hart has, has suggested putting something up in Stormont. You know, just remember his recommendations are only recommendations. They're not set in stone. OK? So in terms of the, we're now facing a full programme of various farmers' memorials, we have submitted ideas to... TOE, they're very much aware of, okay? Um, I'm also been engaging where I think there should be a national, um, some sort of theme, because prior to 1922, these particularly Catholic institutions were still up and running in the north, albeit they were commissioned, the orders were commissioned from down south, um, that th there's I know it's in them as well as the North, yeah, and I think the North and South body is something that can do something with that and collectively put something together as a national thing because I think the HIA must stay alive. That story should never mm -hmm. be forgotten. And a bench does, I'm sorry, it doesn't do it. It can be part of an overall programme, yes, I get that. But if our legislators are to learn from the mistakes of the past and it's in the Rotonda area, I'm sorry. It doesn't give us weight. It doesn't give us credibility. There's no human element in that particular side, side effect. And I think while the, while the intention may be there to the word of Sir Anthony Hart available to remind legislators, I also think it's hidden in a corner. It's almost like you're ashamed of it. It doesn't belong there. It belongs out here. It belongs at the bottom of those stairs. It belongs, given the correct permissions, it actually belongs in that great hall. So those coming through this building will understand yeah. what it was, what it was about, and that we have participated not just in what, it, in what the memorial bench is, but we also state why it's there. And that's the part that we need to be participating in. Um, and again, you know, the programme is the way to go. You know, the bench won't meet, meet the needs of people in Dungannon who will never get here won't meet the needs of a 60, 70, 75 year old man or woman living in Derry who will never come to Stormont to see it. Mm -hmm. A programme of, event, of events that is available for them to access one way or another will at least give them the opportunity of choosing what they want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. An individual, and I'll use the word, token bench won't do it. Mm -hmm. Could I just comment as well? I think the programme of work is the way forward, but I still think there should be a strategy built around this, and it should be the survivors that co-create that strategy. But I think also that there's a lot of different views and opinions on what a memorial should be. Survivors have different views on that, of course. So I think really what needs to also happen is some kind of information sharing, some kind of educational uh, programme that goes before it, so that survivors can make an informed view on what they want. If you don't know what's out there, then you can't comment on that. So I think you need to bring in people who have that experience, knowledge of maybe the international arena, and there's some brilliant examples of that. Or mm. you can just do it online, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, you can access a lot of that online. So I think that would be a useful thing to have that information sharing with survivors before that. But crucial, and I'm sorry, I just have to repeat this every time, that has to be co-created, and that has to be around the table, not just going to individuals individuals here and there, it has to be that co-created that, that, that will be meaningful, I think. And to be honest, to be fair to, to the Executive Office and the team, uh, we had people from the Executive Office come to Derry. I had already mooted the idea of local recognition points for suitable memorials. And they came, they, they came with designs, they came with suggestions. I've already spoke with, uh, with Derry and Suburban District Council. And they're open to a suggestion in the right site of putting a memorial in the city that will recognise the, recognize, um, the, the victims and survivors who are from that city. So I think that's something, again, that get, we have a step ahead of it. And it's always like, you know, victims and survivors seem to be a step ahead of it or actually pulling the horse along. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm not going to dismiss the fact that TEO did have a discussion with us, but the discussion we had was around the local, locally placed memorials it, to the best of my knowledge, and anybody who knows me knows I have a pretty good memory, I don't actually remember the bench in the rotunda being mentioned once. Uh, Ron Carroll, please. Oh, thank you. Um, <coughs> the, the strategy um, 
for me, just isn't about um, remembrance. It shouldn't be about remembrance. Um, I mean, <clears throat> even the whole issue around data disappearing came out very, records not being kept. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, for all intents and purposes, a criminal acts. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what I'm interested in is, you know, given that there's one year left of that mandate. So, you know, and so what is the, the present, I mean, I know the present issue is about acknowledgement and recognition, redress is a part of that. But is it about um, the national recognition? And I mean, are there things that you could do in the short term while waiting on? Because I'll be honest with you, I have no faith in so legacy um, investigations, particularly around um, child sexual abuse and things like that, are are you know even without them being in an institution, are really really difficult. Mm -hmm. I have worked with families, mm -hmm. and after them bravely coming forward with what I thought was enough evidence, but I'm not legally trained to fail. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the police won't pursue it, they will, but it then it goes to that whole system. And we've also got Paul and I are aware of even neurology scandal, where the families have went to the police and they're really pushing for the investigations. So in terms of what we can do, what I mean, if we were to talk to everybody in TU, what do you want us to say on your behalf that needs done here and now? I think first of all, you know, I mean, word needs to get out there to to reach as many victims and survivors who haven't as yet got in touch with either the redress board, the commissioner, or or VSS to find a way forward. Let them know there's a way forward. And like abroad, I mean, we had a meeting in 2017, and the head of the civil service said, "Look, there's a gro there's a global strategy ready to be launched." It's 2017. Global no, we're 2024. Yeah. You know, we heard the same thing in the Europa Hotel in 2019. There's a strategy, strategy ready to be launched. All we have to do is, Jerry, what's the word? Yeah. Hit the button. Hit the button. Hit the button. The button's still to be hit. I think someone's running around there looking for the button. But, I mean, we need to get as, the word out there first of all. And the thing is, when people come forward, have the proper resources there to meet them at their point of need. Right now, a year ago, Somebody could have rang up VSS, somebody could have rang up WAVE and said, look, I was in an institution mm -hmm. meeting all of the criteria. I just don't know how to take a step, how to make a statement. I don't know. I'm afraid to do the wrong thing. Come in and talk to us. Come in and talk to us that day. Can you come and see us in three weeks? Because our diary's that full. That's where we're at right now. That's the level that, that, you know, that WAVE and VSS are at over inund or inundated uh, with requests to help people make statements who at this point feel they just can't trust themselves mm -hmm. to write their own statement. Mm -hmm. We know how emotional it is to sit down and try and put 50, 60 years of history down on five pages, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. For people who haven't told their families, who haven't discussed it with anybody, it's going to be a lot more difficult. And we need to ensure that the proper resources are there with the organisations that are supporting victims and survivors, the Commissioner's Office, Victim Support, and, uh, and WAVE. That's initially what needs to be done. Check their budgets, find out what they need, find out what we can give. And remember, there's a big broad purse out there that hasn't been opened yet. And the institutions have to cover part of the cost of that. 100%. Can I just say, Carl, you know, you're asking what the committee could do, and you're talking about a year that's left. Yeah. And some kind of thinking, well, what do you mean by there's a year left? Maybe mm -hmm. the role of this committee is to take it forward and say it shouldn't be a year left. Mm -hmm. If there's a year left mm -hmm. of the redress, maybe that should be extended. Its job has not been done. Exactly. And has not been done properly. And also the commissioner's office. Mm -hmm. I mean, if her remit and her time is over in a year's time, surely that should be extended as well. So I would ask the committee to take that forward to extend that th that's this one year that we're talking about and the, and the point for consideration to raise there is that when david sterling initially put out the consultation on the redress legislation mm -hmm. it was to close in december we asked because of COVID, we asked that it be extended by three months the release of the the release of the application for 
I actually arrived the day of the first shutdown. I printed off 150 copies and personally got them delivered through a community hub to victims and survivors in the, in dairy, in the dairy area. We lost all that time. People weren't able to access solicitors. They weren't able, you know, there's time old there if we're talking about an extension, the justification for it is there was time lost in applications mm -hmm. at the start because of COVID. So, you know, let's not call April 2025 the end date of the mandate. Mm -hmm. Let's push for an extension. And that's why mandate. I asked. Sorry, thanks, me thanks very that. much for raising yeah, that, Carol, yeah. because that could actually have, uh, have sort of gone past me, but thank mm -hmm. you very much for raising um, that. Just, 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 sorry, Paul, just okay. further on that. I think, in, in fairness, the redress, which, as far as I'm concerned, um, would need to be stretched a wee bit further because the numbers are dropping. But we have to ask ourselves why the numbers are dropping. How many survivors still don't know there's a redress scheme out there? Mm -hmm. and, and while maybe the, ma the vast majority of survivors who've got redress is based in Northern Ireland and, and few across the water. But beyond that, Australia, in Europe, in America, there has not been wide publicity campaign, which was launched, and John said the button was ready to go in 2019. Now, that didn't emerge. Now, it doesn't, I, unfortunately, COVID came in, and I understand it, it, it put a span on the works, but nevertheless, the campaign should have went out there because it didn't stop TVs producing programmes, it didn't stop newspapers being printed, they had the internet, the media, and that could have been done that way. And yet, the TOE failed to carry out that, and yet we were told on that day in July 2019 in Europa, it was ready to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sinead? Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thanks, Jerry, John, and uh, Patricia, for um, your updates and the passion that you have around this, and thanks for the advocacy. Um, I think you all know what I felt about that apology at the time. I mean, it was heartbreaking, actually. It was another insult. It was another trauma. Um, for for victims, um, because just the nature of how it how it happened with the institutions been down, but the the quality of the religious orders um, um, apology was was shocking. Uh, I think uh, they exposed themselves that day um, for all to see very very clearly. Now. Um, Fiona said something earlier on, and, and um, I connected with me. She says, you know, don't say HIA, Historical Institute of Childhood Abuse, call it what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to do the same about the culpability mm -hmm. and uh, about the, the compensation. We need to <coughs> call the religious orders out. We can't say organisations or institutions. We've got to give it a name because mm -hmm they are not being honest brokers in any of this um, and it's my understanding with um, conversations that i've had within the executive office as well that there are you know there's great obstacles been put in the way particularly with some of the institutions the sisters of nazareth etc and they don't want to actually um, come forward with money they're putting obstacles in the way and I think we've got to say it out loud mm -hmm. and clear so the people that are if they come back and listen to this committee they know who they are they are saying no to compensation compensation or they're putting obstacles in the way of it uh, and I think we have to get under the body of that the executive office has a role to play in that and they have to be very robust in it and they have to go after them you know, we can't wait on them coming back to respond or whatever. We've got to go after these institutions. There's a moral obligation that they pay retribution for what they have done to the childhoods and the families of many people right across Northern Ireland, right across this island. And it's shocking. And they are no moral authority for anything if they cannot address the wrongs of the past. And there's a, an obligation. I feel very, very strongly about it um, because you know we can't sit here and talk around this as if it's you know some kind of obscure bodies. They're here. They're alive and well. And some of them are still telling us how we should behave. And that is absolutely, totally objectionable. So the executive office needs to deal with this, and they need to deal with it robustly. And I don't even think they're being actually ambitious and how and and, and uh, assertive enough in how they actually go after their money their hidden assets and their trust bodies uh, uh, and all of that they have acres of land we know it in our city john acres of it 
They're rich organisations and they have money and they should pay. Sorry, that's not a question, it's just a statement. Can I just say something there on that? You know, there seems to be a lack of transparency around all of that. Exactly. You know, I've been asking a lot of questions around that and can't get answers to it. You know, so there's some kind of negotiation going on behind closed doors. So maybe the job of this committee, the scrutiny committee, yeah. is to also ask for information about that. Well, I asked yeah. on, I think it was the first meeting, I asked where, where, where they were at with it, and they said that there was this process, but it was a it was a broad sort of discussion, and I think that certainly after this today, we, we've got a lot more information, a lot more ammunition to go back with that. Mm -hmm. So, I'm, go ahead. Are you sorry? Are you oh, I did have a, con a conversation with the independent mediator who was responsible for putting together mm -hmm. the framework. And I think that was in January, and he told me that he had sent his draft proposal. He didn't tell me what was in it. He'd sent it to the First and Deputy First Minister. But without a First and Deputy First Minister in office, it wouldn't be enacted or it wouldn't be looked at until that happened. So now is the time to ask the First and Deputy First Minister what happened, these proposals, and when. I, and I think the public has a right, not just we as victims and survivors, I think the public has a right to know what is being proposed and what is and what is what is being proposed and secondly what is being offered by the institutions if anything because that pressure has to be particularly now with the with the with financial pressure here and here that every penny is going to count every pound is going to count and trust me every million pound is going to count mm -hmm. thank you brian please okay um your information has been very powerful and very helpful to us. So th thank you for that. Um, a few specific questions I want to ask. Um, I don't know if it'll be possible to get the apology redone. Um, what What is your view on that? All of you, Jerry, though you raise it particularly. Um, I mean, do you feel it needs to be redone? Needs to be done properly, or uh, and I don't know whether it's possible once it's been done. Formerly by the parties yeah, redo, yeah. in in yeah. in the way that it was done because of the circumstances at the time, but, but what is your own view on it? I think there was an opportunity there in March, but I had to tell you we'd been more open and transparent that this apology was going out. I mean, we got notification on the day the apology was going out on the assembly floor. In case the media get in front, get ahead of you, we're letting you know in advance. So I'm looking up. Internet, newspapers, listening to radios, TVs, nothing transpired. So the question you should ask the TOE officials, why was the media not informed? Because they could have done something about it and said, well, we'll elevate this, that it's now going to be on Hansard mm -hmm. and being given out by the First and Deputy First Minister. Well, there was none there. They didn't do it. Yeah. So the, you have to ask them the question, because I've certainly asked them the question, but you're getting this very vague answer. Mm -hmm. I have to say it's a joke. And I think in fairness, you know, it, it, it more or less was a heads up from TO yeah. to me saying, look, the media may get in touch with you because, and it wasn't that an apology was going to be made in the chamber. It's that a question is going to be asked about mm -hmm. the apology. So I assumed mm -hmm. that the question was going to be about the apology that had been made in March uh, last year. So I said, OK, if they get in touch with me, I know what I'm going to do. And it was, it was on the news that night, actually, it was a very, very small clip on the news that night. I actually got to go on to the Assembly website to see the full thing, to actually see. And for me, it was important that the First and Deputy First Minister took their place and made that yeah. apology. That was important. And I'm not going to take anything away from each of the individual ministers who took part in the apology here mm -hmm. in March last year. Mm -hmm. That was powerful. It was moving. The reason why? Because they actually let us know what they were doing. They actually asked us, what do you think we should say in this apology? We asked the institutions, would they give us a heads up on yeah. what they're doing? And they literally shut the door. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And what I've said is it's almost like this apology was written 10 years ago when they were told it was going to be an apology. The apology was written, it was thrown in a drawer, and it was pulled out and handed to somebody saying, take that to Stormont tomorrow and read it. And that was, and it was read with as much, with as much enthusiasm and as much passion as a shopping list. Hmm. Okay, well, there's something for us to look look at. Um, uh, two other specific questions I want to ask. Uh, can you clarify, John, in terms of did you 
Are you saying that in the Republic of Ireland, the institutions have paid out? Or? The institutions have contributed to the fund. But, uh, but uh, have given not a penny in Northern Ireland? Not one penny. Right. Not one penny has come from any of the institutions in the North. Although I did see somewhere a note that said two of the institutions who were not named are prepared to make contributions. And another two are in discussions as to whether or not, and we probably know who one of those is, um, is uh, are in discussions as to whether or not and what level of contribution they should make. Okay. I don't think that should be their choice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows what this is going to cost. Okay, no, well, we will follow these up. And where are the time? Very quick, yeah, briefly, Chair. From your understanding, can you clarify um, the the range of institutions we're talking about in terms of types of children's home, mothers and babies home, yeah. Magdalen laundries? Is it more than that? Or? Yeah, they also included, um, and again, because they were in the care of the state, they also recruited, included manned home, or, um, remand homes, uh, remand centres, and, uh, and, uh, and borstals. And anywhere that a child, that anyone under the eighteen, under the, the age of eighteen, was uh, was placed <coughs> in the care of the state. Right. Um, so it's it's remand homes, borstals. Um, there were hospitals included. There were children's homes. There were voluntary homes, and there were state homes. Mm-hmm. And that first volume of uh, the report lists all of that, right. sets all that out, yeah, and that first couple of pages, I think, even. And, and, you know? without, yeah. and it also lists the institutions, and yeah, we're back yeah, to yes, Sinead's yeah. point. Yeah. Right, that's fine. So yeah. we have the list that we can work yeah. off. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Emma? Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks to you all for this this afternoon. It's really valuable and it's really powerful. And I suppose as somebody who grew up in rural Ireland and found out in later life that some of these things had impacted some extended members of my own family. Um, I mean, the reference to institutions and, and what you've said there, I mean, the Catholic Church in particular, I suppose people have voted with their feet in terms of, 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 of what they've done in this state on the other side of the border, and it's not good enough. And all of that hurt has been exacerbated by the failure to to recognise it and apologise it for for it properly. Um, so all I can do is apologise to you for how you've been treated and to say very clearly that we'll do whatever we can do in terms of holding the department to account. But the points that you're making are being heard very clearly, especially around the wealth that is there and that has been withheld from victims and survivors. It's not, um, it's, it's not good enough. And it's this, this whole culture of secrecy and shame and the fact that people were bullied into going along with a system that oppressed young people for decades, for generations in this country. So um, I, that, I don't have a question as such, just to thank you all. And um, well, just on that, I mean, the, the, the treatment and the contribution is the same as the apology with no emotional attachment whatsoever. Mm. There's an obligation, a duty, a moral duty on their part mm. that while they took part in the Bam Bridge and they were, they were investigated and found that there was feelings, systemic feelings, okay? That the apology was one thing. I think a recognition is very, very important as well because the state of playing their part, they have to play their part. And I totally agree with John. You got to you got to run after these people and make sure that they, that they pay up. Simple as that. And I guess you're going after them with a legal arsenal. Yeah. Forget about voluntary contributions. It's not going to meet your need. They're going to ensure it's not going to meet your need. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, there's, there's a lot there. Really, really appreciate your contributions today um, and, and for everything you've done, not just today, but but in the months and years um, prior to this. Um, we, as I we will review what was said there. There's a lot of actions, a lot of things we need to follow up on, and I can assure you that we will keep you posted in our That's endeavours right. in terms of holding not just CEO but the institutions to account. Thanks um, so much. So thank you, uh, Professor.
Patricia Lundy, Jerry McCann and John McCord. So thank you. Members, I'm going to um, suspend the meeting for just five minutes, just for a comfort break. I'm conscious being sitting here for five minutes. We then have another panel um, of members, but um, for now, so thank you very much. And we'll resume maybe at ten past okay. four. Committee Room 30. Sound. 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 Committee Room 30. Sound.
Committee Room 30. Signed. 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 Okay, um, members, I just want to reopen the meeting and thank you for, for a few minutes there just to get a bit of fresh air and refreshments. Um, apologies to uh, our next panel for keeping you waiting. I think we yeah. there was just a lot there was just a lot there to yeah. get covered. So I uh, uh, appreciate you waiting. Um, so today um, we've um, asked Margaret. Magugan from Savia and sorry Polly, just what's your first name? My name is Una, Una. Mitnis. So um, ladies, if you just want to make some opening remarks and then we'll, we'll get down to questions. Yes certainly and obviously um, it'll have to start with the memorial yes. which provisionally was a bench but that was only a one small part of the programme and what was discussed by the executive office. So it's not just about this bench yes. but Thank you for showing me the rotunda properly. I know I've walked through there going to the where yeah. the apology was, but my mind wasn't right at the time that I realised it's locked away behind those yeah. walls. And you know, everything was hidden behind them walls. We were hidden behind them walls, you know. So we don't want the memorial to be hidden around behind walls again, out of sight. Mm -hmm. So it has to be in that main hall. And I've spoken to the TEO again yesterday about that. And they said about fixtures, um, you know, if there's anything going on in the big hall, like um, we can't move these, how, how can you not move? You know, this plate, this this bench can be uh, just fixed there, and and stay put put in place there to stay there. You know, people if they're walking up or having a fence or whatever, can they let them all see it? Students and tourists and dignitaries and from all around the, the world, let them see it. We don't want to be. We've been hidden and. Brushed, things brushed un, under the carpet all our lives, you know, so we want it in the main hall. But as I was saying, there's other educational um, stuff that's been, we've all talked about, the TEO have been around to the groups with these, and, and designs, and you, you've been there too, you yes, know, that when yes. we met in the Europa and that. Yeah, yeah. You know, different programmes, educational programmes, going into universities and schools, even with social workers, I've met with um, FOIPEC, Voices of Young People in Care, and you know, when I've spoke to them, and they need to know a lot, and, and it's only the like of us that they can learn that from, you know, so there's, the, and, and they were open to that, the Executive Office were open to that, so it's not just a bench. So I think they, what we're talking about um, here, and making sure we get through to the Executive Office, as I will, if nobody else does, is to get that bench into the main hall. And regarding Oh God, where do you begin here? Um, yeah, the religious orders. And that's the, that's what we have in the newspapers today. That's been on my mind for so long. It was the religious orders. 
in our cases here, and especially my brother who died on the 7th of June at the, the day I launched that book, but we went ahead in his memory. You know, on the 7th of June, I go up and there's a headstone there, and every time I see it, he's still, he's 7th of June, it's quite recent. He is in that, in an early grave, because of what the religious orders did yes. to him, from a four-year-old in the Nazareth Lodge, and, and raped and abused her. And then, by the De La Salle order, I can say it, say it out loud because this is the truth, the De La Salle, Salle order in Raban House, Kirkcubbin, notoriously renowned for their violent sexual abuse. You know, and he went through all that. And I had to find that out from him when he, he had seen me on the TV. And uh, I told him what was happening, and I didn't want to believe anything had happened to him. You know, he told me about the strippings and the beatings, and then when he told me about, well, he was made to play games, and I asked him what type of games, and he said, you know, love games. And that was his interpretation of sex. You know, and I didn't want to hear that coming from him, so he was so badly abused, you know. He had physical conditions attached to that, I don't want to describe that, you know, and that remained so to the end of his days, you know, where uh, he ended up in a car home, he ended up in Muckamore, and he shouldn't have even been there. So he has been dealt a very raw deal uh, by society, you know, instead of um, putting him back into the community. They kept him in Muckamore, locked him up there, and he, all he did was cry to get home. I want to go out. They could have resettled him into the community, and they didn't. Even to get a procedure done, I had to go after this, a procedure to stop the bleeding from his yeah. abuse all them days, yes. years and years. And they said it was against his human rights, and I had to get that overturned, um, where a consultant looked at me in Causeway Hospital, and after I appealed to him, he says, OK, he has no capacity, you can overrule this. And I got that procedure done just a month before he died, you know. So he has been failed, so many people have been failed. But what really irks me is the TEO here not doing their job once again and going after the religious orders. It has been, as you all know here, one fight after another. Why should we do this fighting? Why should we get the media on board again? And I'm going to keep at this here. I'm texting away here to get every media here. Come on, let's do something. Let's barrage them. If we have to go and start protesting again outside their buildings mm -hmm. and remembering that they have uh, costed these buildings at the price they got them in 1920, 1922. The Spotlight Programme at Dara McIntyre in 2009, uh, he uncovered this. You know, this is what the greed of them and to, to, the cheek of them to call themselves Christian mm -hmm. and to do these dirty deeds. They're far from uh, being Christians, yeah. you know, uh, and they certainly didn't do it in God's name, no. you know, and that's why he has used us to do this, this job, yes. you know what I mean? Uh, they fail so many, and, and they're running away there. God knows what they're doing with their buildings and their land, you know, and they need to be, you need to be doing this to run off them and not, don't let them away with it. They got away with it for so long down the south, you know, and I thought I was going to get a break. We were going to get a break. You know, and because I, I've been run into the ground too after it all, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't let up. I wouldn't let up. And I had that boldness about me and tenacity. You know, I shouldn't have had to do this. And I remember from even 2008 when it started and 2009 and all the promises and yes, and we'll do this and we'll do that. You had to hound people to do their job. So the executive office are a complete, in a complete shambles. And they'll tell you one thing and then do another. And then they'll leave it on the long finger. So please, I'm telling you, just please go after them because we're not going to let go of this. <coughs> you know, um, we, somebody raised there about the housing, the housing situation. You know, so many, are, uh, it's a real trigger when people are looking at housing. I think that's when Jimmy heard that and he didn't come in again. That just people being offered to go into um, assisted living, you know, um, which just triggers. I know that personally. And, uh, you know, in and, and, and the care homes, you know, who wants to go in? People have opened up here just recently and have been re-traumatised and to go into these, you know, if there was some uh, uh, discretion or some uh, communication with the housing executive in relation to that and to be more aware and, and just to put something in place and be more considerate than to say that, you know, people put you into assisted dwelling or a care home. 
you know, I, I know firsthand all about that there and with so many others. Um, even, again, about the redress scheme um, that has been um, up and running for so long. That was a com another complete disaster. At the beginning, we had to fight with these people as well. That's what it was like, a battle. It's in the book. Sorry. Uh, not promoting it. Just everything's in there, and you can read it, Brian and uh, Harry, Harvey. Anyone else? Yeah, no. you know um, the struggle and the fight from 2008, 2009, right through, and there we're back still here. And what what has been done? Do you know? And the the TEO again, uh, tick boxing. This is what they did um, when they said they were going to go after the religious orders, and it was Bernardo's as well in the Church of Ireland. So you know, inclusive of them all. And uh, so that was, that was just to keep people sweet. So I know what way they behave. And they're, they're storming political speak, as it were. You know, but I got very upset and annoyed that they still haven't did anything. You know, so why do we have to go now back to the media? And I will do, you know, to get them on board. So they have to fork out. You know, they're billionaires. And, and that's something. We just want that finished. So I would ask that you all go after them, as I will continue to do so. You know, I know yes. you wanted to talk about the services. Yeah, the services, you know, the, um, you know, they had put in services like VSS and Way of Trauma. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're really basic, you they're, know. Yeah, they're really basic, you know, services, you know, basic, you know. Um, and it's all... <laughs> Kind of way signposted, everything's signposted, you know, uh, we'll give you the number for this and we'll give you the number for that and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then, then you're, whenever, you know, what would, what would you like us to do, you know, you're not kind of way and, you're, and it's basic. And then if it's something like, you know, like I was offered something for like, for my, you know, like um, a membership for something and that membership was like only for me you know it's not like something like for you know what why, why would i want to go somewhere on my own it was for the national trust or something like that mm. it was like a membership for the national trust but it was only for me like you know if you want why, why would i want to go somewhere mm. on my own mm. you know i would like to take my like my granddaughter with me and my daughter with me you know that's I think, silly. Yeah, I think the services need to be re-looked at the media kind of way need to be re-looked re at you know you know offer more to um, yeah. an individual, but also a family member to, yes. to come along with you in that. Um, you know, op open more. Like Emma spoke on that. Um, it's a transgenerational you know, renter, but if we, how you, you know, describe that, yeah. because our children are affected, There's, you know, yeah. to include family. Yeah, inter yeah. generational, you know, to add families onto that as well. Um, and the services are very far and few between. We you know, have to suggest things. They'll we have not to offer us stuff anything to people. We have to. We have to suggest something. I mean, I, I have to tell you something here. You know, like I wasn't able. To, you know, there was times I was. You know, I was on a, a welfare, not a, um, a, a support worker, and you know, there, there was something. You know, I couldn't think of something in particular for me that I wanted that I, I was interested at the time. You know, it's more or less you have to contact them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one, one said to me at the time, well, do you want to, like, come out of way of trauma then? And he says, well, not really. He's me. I, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a client. I'm, I'm still a victim of historical mm -hmm. abuse. I'm still a victim, you know. I me. no, I don't want to come out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. that's the question yeah. they put to me. The well, attitude. That's the, that's the question they put to me. He says, no, I, I'm, I'm still a victim. I'm still a victim as and a slash survivor. I mean, no, if I if I was to give up, um, my, me being a client of yours, me, where would, where would that put me? Now, and saying that also, you know, I've had to have good help from a welfare officer who was able to help me through my process of for migration from working tax credit to mm -hmm. universal credit. So I'm not, yeah. Yeah. I'm still not. Mm -hmm. You know, there is good people in there as well, but there is, you know, there needs to be a balance between. Wave trauma and VSS, because VSS are the same. You know, I had a problem with um, my redress from from me from me turning from migration from universal credit to or from working tax credit to universal credit in regards to my redress. You know, that affected your award. Well, no, I thought it was going to, but there was a lot of stuff 
I was stressed about, very, very stressed about, whereas the welfare officer wasn't aware of herself, you know, because there's things I had to end up phoning the redress board myself because of the universal credit, credit uh, um, bothering me about me showing my saving, my compensation award. That's a, that's a big one. Can I comment on that there, where a lot of people are being contacted um, to look into people's savings and where you got that money, and it's, it's scary. You know, this is what they're doing. Maybe if there's something could be raised there with the Department of the yeah. Communities. It's yeah. happened to me a couple of times, and it's horrifying. Do you, know, do you know, so can you imagine people less vulnerable? They're doing it all the time. Yeah. And where did you get this? And what's that transfer? And I had to say, well, that's my son. I'm tra transferring where you tra you're being grilled mm -hmm. as if you're a criminal. Mm -hmm. So could somebody please look into this? It's a serious business. It's the Department of the Communities yeah. um, looking into your savings. And that's a quite, a, quite a few times. I, was just, I just wanted, I, the, really what we wanted to raise yeah. was about the religious orders. Yeah. and to go after them. But I'm going to just say about victims coming forward, I don't really know if there's that many out there left. Do you know? Uh, yeah, there's no problem looking and searching, but I feel that we have really did the groundwork here over the 15, 16 years. You know, we haven't been off the media, you know, all across the world. With You know, we've been high up there, and it's been the biggest inquiry in Europe, and it got maximum publicity, it did. There's so many people who won't want to come forward, but I suppose if they hear about the carry-on or the redress scheme at the beginning, when that was awful to even having to go through that, you know, where there was uh, maximum complaints non-stop. It's been a disaster, I must say, this whole um, effort of doing that from 2009, you know, and, and, and even when Peter Robinson and Martin McGuinness was in place, and not the promises, but they leave it down to this department, that department, as somebody touched Claire Subden, Say it, they, they put it around it, and this is what they do. But who do they think they're kidding when your eyes is wide open and you see that? I, I trusted them at the very beginning, and then I got my eyes open, and that's in there too. Where then you, you know you had to pull them up on it, and that's when Peter Robinson and Martin McGuinness took it under their remit because these other departments couldn't have had no clue what to do. Yeah, do you know? But and, and searching for more people, I don't know if there's any more out there, are they all dead and gone? Or, or can they be annoyed now? You know, and, and in particular the pittance that is coming from the redress board. You know, there's been a couple of cases there by the time they did get to the court, which I suppose it's okay, I'll not mention names, a quarter of a million and a half a million. You couldn't pay victims, but for the pittance that you get out of that redress and what you have to go through in that redress, you know, people are offered 10,000, 15, 20, 30, the maximum is 80 for the rape and abuse and the ruination of your complete life. You know, like my brother, we Kate, who could, just couldn't face this today, you know. So there's been one thing after another, and there needs to be a complete overhaul of the TEO. They need to be reined in here. Uh, I'll not mention the, 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 his name, probably watching. He needs reined in too, and to find out what are you doing about the religious orders, and that's where I'll, I'll finish on that there. But I'll not stop. You know. Thank you very much, ladies. Another pile in your hands. <laughs> Thought I was going to retire. I was made for this. Mm -hmm. I suppose, um, Margaret, just picking up your point there around your brother Kevin and around mm -hmm. the Delta Raw deal, and I'd forgotten that part of his story about that he, he ended up in Muckamore, and we've got that on, ongoing inquiry into yes. there around the almost present day yeah. abuse of people in our institutions. So this is not a historical issue, this is a recent. Yeah, very, very recent. So thank you for reminding mm. us and sharing us that information about your brother. It's just it's horrendous and, and also your insight into the memorial um, bench and I think that everybody today has said pretty much the same thing. Just going forward, um, ladies, um, what what should society, what should TO, what, what should um, VSS, we have, what, what do you need to make the remainder of your lives better going forward? Do you know, even what happened down the south, they looked after the people far better. Yeah. Do you know, even in uh, provision in their houses, if they needed anything done. Do you know, there's people there that you can, you know, I get phone calls all the time about hanging pictures up. Do you know what I mean? If their washing machines go, they, they got all that supplied for them. With the services here, with, with the services here, um, you just it's, whether it's counselling or uh, maybe getting your feet done, something like that, you know. Um, your gardening done. 
the, 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 <laughs> and um, sorry, you know, um, they did a lot more, more specific. What is needed here, if and especially if the religious orders were to contribute, I think it's all down to funding here. You know, so it is quite basic. If they were to contribute, that money would go and help for prof- to provide professional help, not just. It's very basic here, and and then when you do get counselling from the Wave Trauma Centre, who I, I I love them all. You know, they're great, and I love the Victims and Survivor Services run by Nicola Nugent and Lucinda Dugan, Rosie Smith. You know, they are brilliant. They are lovely. But they just haven't got it all together to, to give you or to look after. So they're only picking up on this recently themselves. You know, they didn't know what to do. They don't know how to. How do you treat my doctors? Uh, uh, you can contact me years later when you see me on the TV. And she says, I remember you coming in at the beginning of this and you talked about your triggers and the footsteps and all. And he says, Margaret, I didn't know what to do or what to tell you. And that's a qualified doctor. Do you know? But th- professional help, professional People, psychiatrists, psychologists, you know, who would know? But the people, they have, really don't know. They're, they're not um, professional. Um, they're not really educated into knowing. Maybe they do need to do a lot of research instead of um, us having to ask them what to do. But just one last thing about the counselling. You know, why should people, when, when they're really ready to go down under... To be asked all these about 38 questions before you get to talk about. I know it firsthand because um, I haven't been too well myself. And this is what 38 questions. Start of the counselling. We're talking about yeah. the start of the counselling. And this is like uh, a questionnaire that you have to go through, which will be used for to uh, gain funding in the future. Yeah. People are ready, and it happened to a sister, my sister. And she went just with her doctor, but and that was a big deal for her to go through to counsel. And she says, some young girl asked me all these questions. I'd have loved her to receive that. You know, she needed it. But she, she went away, and that's it. You know, she's my older sister, and she would never go back again because you're looking for somebody to talk to, crying your eyes out, mm-hmm. just somebody to comfort you and say it's going to be all right, to be asked about all these questions. Mm-hmm. Why can't they leave that in their, to midway? Just put it midway or something. Could somebody, something be done about that? To change that, you know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Connie, please. Yeah, thank you both so much for coming in um, and sharing your experience and how it's impacted you. It's, it's really important and I, I, know, I know it mustn't be easy at times. So I think I just kind of wanted to tease a bit more of that out. And it does, I am getting the impression from this that, and others in the committee have talked about this as well, that there just isn't that... You know, people aren't trained. There isn't that trauma-informed mm-hmm. approach, and Care yeah. and Fairness has has recognised that. Um, not just within TEU services, but throughout healthcare settings, mm-hmm. and as you said, Department for Communities. And did you find the actual application process for the redress board and having to, um, you know, provide information to that? Did that almost re-traumatise you Absolutely. and others that you know in a way? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, from everybody you knew, and it was that time that we were sheltering. You know, and I had the, the Messenger page, page up and the Facebook page up. And I was getting this non-stop. You know that? Yes. You yeah. know what I mean? Oh, so yeah. it, was a, mm-hmm. it was like me being the commissioner or whatever, unpaid. Yeah. And you still get it. And I'm still being contacted. Yeah. But what I do is just pass them over to the, um, the sur- uh, Nicola Nugent and Lucinda Dugan. So that's what it is. It's a, a signposting thing. You know, but we had to look after them. We were left to look after everybody there when things went wrong, even with the solicitors yeah. or whatever, and in particular the redress board. You need to even had to even find my own contacts in there who would maybe allow to talk to. You weren't allowed. There was this data stuff, and you know that you weren't allowed to speak to anybody. You know what I mean? And it was like God Almighty, it was awful. The authoritarian. Um, issue, uh, you know, aspect all over again, looking down on you. It was awful. It was horrendous mm-hmm. going through that. Um, yeah. I wouldn't want, I think everybody's been damaged, more damaged from going through this again. Yeah, and that, yeah. I think that that's obviously what we don't want. And I think we need to really recognise the role that people such as yourselves, you know, sharing their own stories mm-hmm. and putting themselves out there to help others and connect others and really do that from the yeah. ground up has been driving force behind this and you shouldn't have had to do that so I think that's really important and also I'd say I think we're all very much agreed here that the way the um, 
religious orders um, have refused to really come forward with compensation um, has just been completely unacceptable um, as well. It's not just from a financial perspective, but it's no. important, as you said, but it yes. is to recognise what they did was wrong as well. Yeah, and be, they have to be held accountable, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, acknowledge that they done wrong. Yeah. No, absolutely. Thank you. Claire, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, like, thanks for coming in. Um, and I think it's clear from your presentation and the other presentations we've had today that we really as a committee have to push the executive office to do their role in trying to get answers and to get these payments made as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. So Chair, if this is appropriate, you know, can we make a proposal that we have the officials in front of us and you know in the very near future and, and I pro- do that myself, we need to call them yeah, back. Provide that scrutiny and um, maybe it's the, the, the first and deputy as well, I'm not sure. But what about the religious orders? Could we get them in? Oh, <laughs> well I'm, I'm maybe, invite them yeah. <laughs> maybe take advice on that one. But but certainly from from a governance and from a public perspective the executive office very yeah. much have the responsibility scrutinized. so you know as a committee I you know make that proposal that we scrutinize them yeah 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 we'll, we'll, we'll invite them brilliant thanks <laughs> um carol please i think we need to get the religious orders yeah. in yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah yeah because um even just so we can look you in the face and say yeah. that we have done everything yeah. we can um i mean <clears throat> i think everybody around this table regardless you know, can be nothing but determined to try and pick pieces up for you as mm-hmm. time runs out. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, the religious orders, uh, I believe, including Bernardo's, who aren't a religious yeah. order, but they, th- they all, they yeah. all need to be invited to yeah. come in. Yeah. And that's that's and anything else that we yes. need to do. Yes. This, I'm, I'm confident that this committee will try and do its best. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks Chair and thanks to you both again um, and for, for sharing your, your own testimony so openly and honestly. Um, I actually think that it, perhaps if we were doing this again it would have been useful to have your, your um, presentations before oh, yeah. the Commissioners yeah. and maybe ha- because the Commissioner mm. gave us, you know, yeah. the, the, the report are not saying for for one second that what that what she presented wasn't accurate but it was very much you know these are the statistics of the number of people we've reached and we're committed to reaching as many as possible and all the rest of it and then some of the flaws with the process that you in particular you know were able to to highlight Mm -hmm. um i suppose i think it would be beneficial for for her to be to hear to to be here to hear that um and, and concur with everything that's already been said around bringing the religious orders here i mean it's that same, like you referred there to universal credit, mm-hmm. which is a British Tory government policy. Mm-hmm. Punitive, we've all, we all deal with it in the offices. The whole point of it is to put people under pressure yeah. and to make people um, who are already living yeah. in, in low income situations The panic. shame that goes along with all it, you of know, that. stripping you completely it's, apart. It's so degrading as, as a system and that's exactly how Shame. The the institutions that were involved in this were able to More operate. Shame. It's the exact yeah. same. It's misogyny. It's patriarchy. Mm-hmm. It's people don't fit into their idea yeah. of what is correct and proper, and therefore they can treat them however yeah. they want. Yeah. And we've had far too much of that, and we need we need yeah. the lid blown open on it. So, um, it just thanks very much, and uh, you know we're committed yeah. to doing whatever yeah. we can yeah. to to try yeah. and address this. Thank you, Chair. Just, just on that point, um, we have uh, a session on the Mullen Baby Homes, and, and I think we will take that lesson from yeah. this, and we will invert to the way we bring yeah. um, the panels forward. But yeah. Okay, sorry, um, Brian, please. Thank you, Margaret Nuna, uh, again for your contribution today. Um, just two specific questions I want to ask. When you talk about the 38 questions for getting counselling support, was that as an assessment to see if you were yeah. eligible or something, or was that with WAVE or was that yeah. with, yeah. with... Although uh, they say it, yes, it, it happens uh, Was it their way, though, of finding out more about you, or do you feel it was almost like to find out if you were eligible? Or? I think there's a bit of um, everything, and how do you feel today, and, and, and if you were the, you know, I have it all This was all done at the very start? Yeah, at the very uh, just start. Rather than starting you off with, tell us yeah. about yourself? Yeah. Right. And okay. I, I went through it there just last week. Right. And uh, even yes. today was another, and, 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 and the, I know the guard was lovely. She says, Margaret, I'm, I mean, it's all right. I, I, can, I, can, I can sense your sound as a pound, you know, you're all right. 
but why I says I'm going to raise this because last week I was in an awful situation. Just I, I know it's it's because of all these years of car carrying this, and, and I kept myself so busy. So, you know, and that's why I was able to do it. You know, get up every morning and campaign. But I think it's the because of all them years, it's just mm -hmm. collapsing, caving in on me. And so I was encouraged to get some counselling because. Anyway, um, but to be asked, and she was lovely, but she says, Margaret, I have to do this. This is right. the way it's done. And, you know, and how do you feel? And what do you think you feel? And how do you feel? You know what I mean? And what, all, just all them questions I can give you. I wrote them all down. Yes. Because so counselling is meant to be about helping you to yes. talk. Mm. Really, yeah. rather than being almost... Made me feel you're angry. being interrogated. You know, and it, or, and yeah. it was shameful. Right. It was shameful too, <coughs> again. Okay, no, well, that's just useful uh, to, to know what specifically how that happened and for your own group um just my own understanding how, how many people are you, are you supporting or would you say do, do, do you have members as such or people who we don't we we're just uh, or your campaigning group as such yeah more? always and uh, we haven't gone away you know either brian no. <laughs> right. do you know i'm saying no more but here you know i would love to take a break love to take a break but you're still I think we're a good point of contact because so many do contact, you know, and that yes. we were always out there from Are you more 2008. Of a, a campaigning group? Aye, uh, you know. You don't yeah. have a, a membership as such? No, uh, right, no. Right. no. We used to, you know, went through all that nonsense, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, we just do. So there's no laws and regulations, so you're free to speak. We're not paid, yeah. not funded, because, you know, we won't be silenced. Mm -hmm. By anyone, you know, the people, mm -hmm. people are uh, paying you there, you, there's only so much you can say. No. Mm -hmm. I just say like to say things as they are and speak the truth, yeah. you know. So, but everybody is affiliated, you know what I mean? And they're just um, from the Shankill and the Falls and Bangor Newton Ards. Mm -hmm. And it was always that way with us all, you yeah. know. Every institution, White Abbey, Rathgale, Kincora, you know, um, Derry, wherever, um, Bangor, everywhere, every institution we had. And it was a lovely group and we're all still in contact and friends and this is the way it was a cross community effort which is just mm -hmm. lovely and we've remained friends for so many mm -hmm. you know so i think we've done more for the cross community effort throughout this you know and got through that uh, religious divide as it were we all had something in common mm -hmm. you know we were children all abused hey it doesn't matter about religion in the end you know that religion mm -hmm. you know dead religion yeah okay thank you martin Thank you, Harry, please. Okay. Maybe just you'd like to tell us a wee bit about your book, Margaret. Oh. Would that be okay? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. Checking me. Yeah, well, I, I, it took me, well, I, I had to, I think that's why I needed to talk to a counsellor then, or someone. Um, I did go to someone before and they had three little clocks sitting. Clocks, yes. Where I think anybody should know you shouldn't have clocks. You know, somebody looking at their watch to see what time it is. Oh, I know. You know, but I think after sort of um, pouring it out from from my, my childhood memories, you know, in the happy times that I had with my mother and father and my siblings, I'm the youngest, and um, and then being left to that, there's that's me as a three and a half year old with a raggy dress, and. You know, and they got so much money off the people where there's money boxes, collections everywhere in every community, you know, but it was never given to us. You know, mm -hmm. that money went to their um, uh, to the mother house in uh, Hammersmith, London. That's the main uh, Nazareth uh, poor. They call themselves the poor sisters of Nazareth and they're anything but. But the brutality went down there, you know, as that child and he, what the damage that was done in there when I got out about 11. You know, where I, I was just so filled with that shame. There's that shame that never leaves you, you know, especially in the way people talk to you in that authoritarian tone. You know, stays with you, triggers stay with you, you know, voices and everything. So I write all about that, you know, and about, you know, not trusting anybody and just feeling you're the loneliest person in the world, you're unwanted, you know. And I, and I write that, it's raw. And that's the way I felt, and then fitting in with um, undesirables getting into trouble, you know, just with a gang, you know, and, and getting mixed up with um, the police, just, just silly things, you know, I went through. But I was only to fit in, you know, because I didn't know where else I fitted. Mm -hmm. I just felt an outlaw, as it were. Um, I wasn't a part of society, so they made you feel that way, 
you know, and, and, and it still remains, you know, and that's why I like to keep busy, to try and get their memories. Their memories will never go away for many of us. It doesn't matter who we talk to, do you know? But I read about that and then it came to such a time then that I, I was in prison and all, you know, um, you know, shoplifting, silly things. It was just your way of dealing with yeah, it? Yeah, and I, I didn't know. I had nobody, because our families were all split up then, because we were split up in, inside the institutions. Mm -hmm. So we had no, I had no one, you know, but I used to pretend that it was all right and, you know, and whatever, and you know, because underneath the lipstick and your garb on you, you know, there there's, remains that, yep. the damage that these religious orders in particular did to us. It'll always remain. And then, you know, I went through it that much. I used to get barred out of every bar, but I didn't know there was, was it because it was the alcohol maybe sedated me a little and whatever it calmed me down. But then this would come up, whatever was wrong with me, and I didn't know what was wrong with me until I did. And I, I'm not ashamed, and I cried out to God in the prison cell, asking what was wrong with me, uh, you know. And he told me. I know he told me. It was me. a personal thing. Yes, yeah. and I began to just break away from whomever and and that's when I found out then what was wrong with me was because of being in there it wasn't my fault yep. you know yep. it wasn't my fault it was their fault you know because I thought they were the next thing to God do you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and we all know that and that, that it's in it's in there it is everything detail about myself you know and that's what gave me the wherewithal I believe and that motivation that was given to me to do this fight and to, to see it through. And that's why we've got this other segment to not allow these religious, so-called religious orders away with it. You know, we can't allow them to get away with this and hope they're watching. Um, okay. you know. thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. That was a great last question, Harry. Uh, and thank you for being so honest and open. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Sinead, sorry. Oh, one more last one, small last question. question. It's sorry. not really, a, it's about memorial again, but one of the things that I've just observed listening to everybody here is about the personal stories. And, um, and when you, you think of the memorial, it, it's about, uh, as uh, Patricia said <coughs> earlier on, um, about the hidden histories. Mm -hmm. And we can't afford as a society to lose those hidden histories. Mm -hmm. What do you think about, um, you know, the victims being given an opportunity to give an oral um, history that we as a society can hold on to as part of the mm -hmm. memorial? You know, I know um, in, um, in, in FOI, there's an organisation, Hollywell Trust, that does oral histories over the troubles and brings yeah. together individuals that were traumatised or something horrendous happened yeah. to them from all across society and brings together their oral histories and, and, and um, you know, you had yeah. the opportunity and the wherewithal yeah. um, to actually write your yeah. story down, but there's others that may not have had that capacity mm -hmm. and that would be a significant um, you know, part of, of a memorial going on um, yeah. if, if, if other victims would be up to telling their story yeah, to, 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 to the done. rest of us. It can't be brushed under the carpet just like they're trying to put that in the yeah. rotunda. Then Sorry, I have had, um, you know, um, occasions where, where uh, victims have had really terrible housing issues um, at, their, at a certain age in their life now and we are working with them and you're working with the housing executive and you're trying to get this point system mm, yes. in place and yeah, you're looking for points here points there in order to make sure that they get top of the list for the allocation of houses is there any pla practical solutions where we can have um you know a sit down with maybe the housing executive to look at a point system where you can actually allocate points mm. to a person who has actually been a victim of um, you know a, a historical institute of or, or abuse or have come through yes. um, you know maybe the mother and baby units or uh, uh, institutions yes. as well yes. and the Magdalene Laundries because there is nothing in the point system that allows for that and and these people are competing at a different level mm -hmm. um, at, at that age of their life and uh, you know I just find it could be a practical solution to some of these things as well that we should collectively sit down and, and discuss. Excellent. About the, the housing issue, and just as we spoke on about putting them into care homes or settled communities, you know, and, and about the point system. If I could follow you up on that, Sinead, um, there's a lot of people, really, um, I don't want to embarrass myself, but um, yeah, it's it's a big, big issue. 
and maybe some discretion, especially mm -hmm. around the mental health and the triggers, and to have the you know they give you so many points and for whatever. But there's a loophole. They're not going to send themselves a, a bullet or get somebody to put a brick through the window. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Some people maybe do that. You know, work but there's more market. no, and there's decent people yeah. that just won't. And if there was some discretion, that that is fatal. Yeah. I would love you really to f um, follow that up, but that's a big, big issue mm -hmm. to resettle them and I mean to get a home of their own because there's a lot of it. A big issue is here, and to finish off, is um, lack of stability, wanting to move. I'll use myself. It's in that book. I think it starts in that, Brian about moving around in case somebody's coming to get you to take it. It's still that child remains in there. Why can you not settle? Because of your time spent in there. You know, it's a big, big thing. And I know people want to settle down now, you know, and they're fighting it hard, but it's to, to get points and stuff. Um, if we could follow that through and get some help, that is a big issue. With the housing executive, that would be great. Thank you. Sorry, Shania, I've missed you there. Any questions? Okay. But, but th thanks to everyone and certainly our, our panelists today and it was lovely lovely to be I think it's the first time I met you and certainly mm -hmm. Margaret that they were both powerful contributions so I say there's a lot there today and we, we give you our word that we will follow up on, on the actions that we've put forward so thank and you let for us know when the TU are here and the religious will. orders that will have will a be our first invite. that will be our first invite so right. thank you very much thank, thank you, you all you thank, thank you Margaret thank you, thank you. see you all soon thank you members I'm very conscious of right. time there were quite a number of we know what you think of there, right. there's quite a lot of correspondence and there were yeah. some actions yeah. if, you're, if you're in agreement I'm actually yeah. going to ask the clerk to email out then so we can yeah. sign off on things by yeah. email if that's okay, okay. That's so I'd fine. appreciate you to respond but um, j just, just one point to note um, the forward work programme has changed a bit we're moving the mother and baby homes from the 1st of May to the 29th of May to incorporate an anticipated publication of the interim report of the independent panel okay. and we're moving the ending violence against women and girls from the 15th of May to accommodate that request I think they're coming on the 8th of May so these issues are, are coming before us quite quickly but members I think I'll close the meeting there and, and yeah. thank you all for I, sorry I just, just want to Raised one point. Um, sorry, apologies. Go ahead. So, sorry, just under correspondence, there's a letter there about common frameworks. Yes. And it, it's just as EU common frameworks, and the letter's titled EU common frameworks. But my understanding, the common frameworks is a UK thing. It's to ensure it is. It is. that the UK internal market works it within, exactly. you know, so it's not actually EU fr common frameworks. It should be, uh, it's yes. a UK <laughs> thing. <laughs> Clerks just advised me it's a, it's a, a, an error within yeah. the within the committee team. Absolutely, one of the one of the actions relates to that. So um, we'll make sure that the correspondence goes out to you by email. We'll have that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. You. So so thank you, Brian, for that, and thank you, members, um, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you. Committee room thirty. Signed.